Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV's podcast 232. Terry Miller, the disc golf guy, along with Johnny V. Uh, and Johnny, there's a lot of things going on here tonight. Not only are we on the wrong night, Ugh. but uh, we're going to have special guest, Anthony Barella, and I think we're going to finally get a return from Dynamite. We are. Dan is back. We're happy to have him for sure. And we've got we've got a lot of things going on. You are not in the studio. You're at your place. I believe you're getting you needed tonight to get ready because you're leaving for Thailand tomorrow. Um, so which means you're on one system. We got Dan on another. We're gonna see what happens and how this comes in. We're gonna have a guest later tonight. Is that correct? Yes, Anthony Barella. A few weeks ago, uh, there was an attempt to have him join us after he won the Shelly Sharp, the PDGA's first eight year that we saw taking place out in Arizona. He couldn't make it. He had some things going on. And I said to him, I said, Anthony, how about I'll come out, I'll cover the Maricopa Meadows Open, you just win that, and then we'll for sure have to have you on, and we can talk about both. And he said, sounds like a plan. And, uh, well, that's what happened. So uh, the young gun, 19-year-old Anthony Barella, is going to join us in about 30 minutes. And we'll be excited to talk to him and uh, catch up with him as he's off to a really, really good start this season. And he's touring more this year, I guess. And he's just going to oh. do very well and all that other stuff. And I think, yeah, I must have... Uh, eh, sorry about that. Someone says Barella or Barella with one L or two. I'm guessing that in the show notes or in the little thing, I probably added an extra L in there. I'll make sure to yep. fix. I'll make sure to fix that. That's on. There me. is just one, one L in there. So just like there's one uh, Anthony, there's one Barella. One one L in Barella, Ella, 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 Ella. Yeah. So, uh, and as many of you guys have already known, whether you saw it on social media or you're following along with the news, or maybe you live here in the Midwest, we are in what is it called a an Arctic polar vortex blast, it, something or other. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. It is. It's brutally cold um i was just telling dana before we came on i flew in from i was in florida for one day doing some work stuff i flew into the airport uh, my car had been there since yesterday morning i got to my car and it wouldn't go it wouldn't turn wow. over that was yeah real fun to come back to so i called they have some guy running around the airport who works for the airport jumping cars i yep, was yep. i was 10th on the list i had to wait about 20 minutes to a half hour <laughs> i come home I, I, it, he jumped it, started great, came home, left my car running for a while, got it in the garage, turned it off, went into the house and thought, oh, my God, my wife hasn't turned on her car since yesterday. Go outside, go to turn hers on. Hers won't start. And then I'm like, okay, cool. I'll jump it with my car. Go out to my car. Go to turn my car on. It doesn't start again. So now, as of right now, I have two dead vehicles at my house. So tomorrow's wow, perfect. Yeah, tomorrow's going to be a fun day to try to get that taken care of i need to get a like a battery charger or maybe a new battery and thankfully i live pretty close to a, like a walmart where they have an auto area so i can literally walk about a block and a half to the walmart where i will get what i need to fix it, <laughs> it it's it, it's it's going to be a miserable day tomorrow for me i can tell already but tonight, well, and, tonight's not gonna be miserable no, and to follow that up, uh, m most of Wisconsin has shut down in terms of uh, school systems are shut down, businesses are shutting down, and for what it's worth, if anyone's second guessing, we're fine with cold weather. Uh, yeah. These are extreme temperatures. This, this is uh, you know negative forty, negative fifty with wind chill. This is brutally cold, uh, just winds and uh, and temperatures. So this is this is no joke. As the meme goes, there's two things here that have shut down. The banks and the bars. We yeah, have, we have and... <laughs> shut down bars in Wisconsin. That's how you know how cold it is. That's something that never happens. No, it's really not. Well, uh, excited. We're going to have Dana might join us. Uh, I think we can get to right to him. Uh, we'll catch up with him, see what's going on. We'll try and keep track of the chat board and see what's going on. And uh, we'll give you some updates from this weekend and talk a little bit about Thailand and some other things going on around the sport of disc golf. We got Dana there? We do. Dana! Under yeah, buddy. My, under my Barilla, Ella, Ella. We have to make hey. that. Can we just nickname him Rihanna? Let's just. No? Isn't she the one who's well, saying? Sure. 
Isn't isn't she the one who's saying under my umbrella, Ella? Ella, isn't that? Yeah, no, yeah, we can go with that. All right, sure. We can, we can. I mean, he doesn't really have, as far as I know, like a really cool nickname yet, and he's just start. He's just just gonna kind of start on tour. We'll get him started out with something really hot, like Rihanna. Yeah, I mean, uh, very punctual, very timely for sure. Let's go with Rihanna and Umbrella. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dana, might you guys keep it warm over there? You're uh, about two hours south of us. Are you guys? Uh, Got everything under control in uh, in J-Town and Illinois and everywhere else you're near? Polar Vortex missed us. No, what? I'm just kidding. It's cold. it's cold down here. It was, you know, 40 below, wind chill. Um, funny note, I, I used to think it was windshield. I'd say, yeah, the windshield is this. And I mm. think Ashley actually had to correct me if that dates uh, how long I said windshield. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah just the first 25 years of your life no big deal <laughs> <clears throat> yeah something like that um yeah it's it's cold we were we were all home today all all four of us it was a long day uh but we had fun and uh i'm uh looking forward to uh tomorrow uh when it finally gets maybe above zero maybe friday i don't know but well, that's, uh, that's yeah winter. wisconsin it's supposed to be 45 degrees this weekend Saturday and Sunday, so I'm assuming you guys are going to see some of that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm uh, looking forward to it. I've got uh, another sold out uh, event at Pine Hills. It's the the annual Ice Bowl. Um, so, yeah, there's a uh, there's going to be, but I think we have another snow system coming in uh, tomorrow night into Friday. So uh, I'm going to be busy out there Friday clearing out uh, tee pads and and uh, just doing some prep for that event. Uh, so, but I know the players will be excited to, uh, you know, have that above freezing temperature, uh, versus, uh, where we're at today. Yeah. Dana, go ahead and give us a, a full blown pl- plug. What exactly do you have going on? Um, I know you're at Pine Hills, but give us some details. So I'm running, uh, an ice bowl event, uh, we are raising money for the Youth Service Bureau Homeless Teens. Um, so it's part of their pro. It's one of their. I don't want to say program or department, but uh, anyways, we've been we've been working with them for the last I think four years or so, maybe five years. And uh, yeah, it's we're together. Uh, some cash, some food, some uh, hygiene items for uh, that end up ultimately in the hands of. Uh, kids that uh and teenagers that may be homeless or or need some need some help so um i'm excited for it as i said it's sold out i think man the last i don't know how many we we're on a sellout streak at, at pine hills and it as you know as a tournament director terry it's nice uh when your events sell out ahead of time um especially versus the day of because if they sell out the day of that that usually means some people are getting shut out but um you know, I'm putting the word out there that that we're at capacity, and uh, it make it makes it easy on my end, and uh, ultimately, you know, it's going to help us raise raise more money. So win win all around. Except for yeah, those, those that want awesome to, to hear. Get it. Awesome to hear. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, Dana. So as always, we kind of lean on you uh, for the first, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes. I feel like I'm doing recaps for everyone in case you aren't a regular listener. But we lean on you to give us a little bit of uh, a taste of what we see around the PDGA calendar for tournaments that took place this last weekend. Uh, Is there anything that uh, jumped out at you? What were some of the biggest events on the schedule? Absolutely. Uh, There weren't any A-tiers this last weekend. There were were a number of... Uh, C tiers and and just a little over a handful, I think, of B tiers. And uh, that's where I'm going to start here is the King's Cup 14. Uh, So the 14th annual King's King's Cup in Kingston, North Carolina. Uh, 88 total players, only 13 of them in the open division, but uh, had some uh, some pretty good players. as you're accustomed to seeing in uh, most North Carolina events, uh, including Dan Hastings, Barry Schultz, Nathan Queen. Uh, we did have Schweb uh, playing, but he was in the Masters division this weekend, and uh, he actually he didn't win. Um, 
we'll, we'll go right into the Masters. Um, usually, you know, if, if there's an event in North Carolina over the last 10 years, Schwabby is, uh, he's, he's usually, uh, he's going to be up there. And uh, he was up there, but unfortunately he tied with uh, Kenneth Turbisky. Uh, they both shot some really good disc golf. They're both 32 under par. Third place was six under par. Fourth place, three under par. Fifth place, two up. So uh, those guys, uh, those guys battled it out, and ultimately Kenneth uh, was able to take uh, Schwebe down in the playoff. <clears throat> now Schwebe, he's he's played over 600 career events. Um, his his win count is somewhere around 238. He wins a large percentage of events, but not as not a, not quite a. Is that Chris? Is that enter Chris Dickerson numbers, Terry? I know you were uh, on social media <laughs> talking about Chris Dickerson's winning percentage, and then I think we even saw an Ulta World. Uh, they followed up with a, a little bit art, an article about that. Uh, I think they picked up what Terry was putting play. down. I I mean, how flattered! What a what a week for media these days. I I put a a few words out there. Next thing you know, there's an article written. Wow. Yes, yeah, so anyway, Chris Dickerson, as we were talking about, I'll follow that all up. Uh, it, 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 legitimately, someone was mentioning on a video from the South Florida Open coverage I did that uh, Chris Dickerson's so good and he's so consistent, and they were really praising him. And, of course, I echoed all of that, and I totally agreed with it. And then uh, I arrived at the conclusion of saying, yeah, I feel like he wins as much as he doesn't, or he's always winning. And then when I looked, he was exactly at a 50% winning uh, winning percentage, uh, taking down 95 out of the 190 events he's been in. And it was mere hours before he was about to play in another event. So the timing was dead on. And sure enough, uh, he went to, what, 52% uh, winning by taking down uh, the event this weekend on Saturday. So uh, no surprise, Chris Dickerson wins another tournament. But very impressive, and I feel like it did spark another really good conversation, Dana. Uh, what are some of the other names, as you just referenced, Schwebe? How about some of the other names that are out there? Uh, you're talking uh, with winning percentages? Yeah, the the people that just, you know, have seemed to dominate. And, and maybe, you know, when you think about it, are there any surprises? You know, we talk about the 100-win per, you know, the 100 win club, the 200-win club. Is there any surprises when you see so many wins as opposed to how many events they competed in? Uh, not really. What? Where? Uh, where's Nico at with his win percentage? I know, you know, the last last few years he hasn't uh, been winning a large volume of events. But when he, uh, you know, when he first really broke into the scene, um, it seemed like he was winning about every other weekend. So I, I'd say he's got to be a person that has uh, has that winning percentage. Uh, relatively high in the scheme of things uh nico has 388 career events and he's at 116 career wins so he's about one for three hmm. maybe just a hair under that that's pretty good i would i'd, I'd take that i mean <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah like, I, I'm like I, one for I'd 200 so i'm good i would be good if one for three yeah right um you know and then you know, I, full disclosure, I did not read the article. Every every week I, I say to myself before Smashbox, should I just go on Alta World and uh, verbatim repeat uh, everything that they're saying? And uh, I just can't – I haven't been able to bring myself to that yet. But uh, I would say probably Climo has got to have a pretty insane winning percentage. Um, obviously, Macbeth, um, he's, probably, he's probably in there. I'd say probably – on par with Nico, maybe even a, a little bit better would be my guess. Yep. Climb was just under 50% as far as current uh, career events and career wins. She's at 456 and career wins are 223. It's funny because uh, your daughter's peeking in on the side, but nobody can see it because we've got you trimmed out there, Ken's. Uh, it's, Ken's, no one can see you yet. All right. We're going to get a super quick hello from one of my, uh, one of my daughters here. Okay, say hi to everybody. Hi. Hi, Ken's. That's Dana Might. Yep. Hi, Dana Might, and hi, Johnny V. Hi, Ken's. Everybody my loves sisters. you. Everybody loves they you on the internet. Yeah. So I see 
this is the interesting part when I actually uh, do this from home is uh, Allison's in the other room currently uh, chatting on the chat board, my daughter. And then uh, this one decided to come in here. Oh, my gosh. All right. We're going to quickly say hello. Uh. Guys, we have, believe it or not, we have real things to do. So that's what the Internet looks like, guys. You've seen it before. I know, but it's just so. <gasps> there, there you are. <laughs> okay. Oh. So quickly say hello uh, before we uh, let you guys get out of here so we can get back to actual business here tonight. See, okay. see, that's the number one rule is you can't sit and read the comments because you get totally lost and you don't pay attention to what's going on on the actual show. Whatever. All right. It's a pro tip for right. you girls. <laughs> pro tip for you girls. All right. Say good night, girls. Bye, Dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Good bye, night. Bye. All right. Bye. Yes. Mackenzie and Allison. Some other night we'll have... You'll, yes, they learned how to sign this. Uh, so another night, we'll, 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 they'll have their own podcast. So and It won't be too long. Um, I don't, I don't want yeah. that. So uh, we definitely have to, you know, when you look at some of those numbers uh, from the winning percentage side, obviously everyone wants to throw out a lot of the FPO side of things, as they should. You have a dominant player like an Elaine King who's uh, been playing for a number of years, but then also winning uh, a large percentage of the events that she's played in. Uh, it's, it's, I think those are some interesting numbers. Um, and of course, there's a little regional bias and there's how, how stiff is the competition at some of these events for one player versus another. Uh, I, I, at one point, I quickly looked at Steve Rico's numbers, you know, knowing that he crested the 100 win club uh, in the last couple of years. So uh, it, it, interesting to see. And then, like I said, when you're comparing that. So the question, the real follow up for you, Dana, would be. Will if Dickerson really does hit the road this year, as as talked about and as planned, wins are going to be that much harder. I mean, we're not going to see him open this season with 13 consecutive wins or whatever it was he did in 2018. Um, the wins are going to be at a much tougher challenge to come by. That's is, is that an all too obvious statement? Little little obvious, but uh, definitely definitely worth stating, and it's definitely worth stating that. With him being a top ten player, it wouldn't, uh, you know, if he if he picked up a couple, you know, let's say in the first five or six weekends of let's say the the major events, you know, the tour events, meaning the national tour, pro tour, and some of the eight tiers in between those. If he if he picked up a couple wins, I think that would be that would be huge. But um, it's uh, you know, it's good. I'm not putting him down at all, but it's going to be a little different, you know in the, the win loss column, aside from, you know, getting, getting these wins that he's, it, it's not easy to win, but. A a absolutely. Harder. And I don't think that's a, a rip on him uh, whatsoever, but I think we all know you're, you know, your regional B and C tiers just clearly don't have as many challenges and obstacles and top level players as he's going to find at all the pro tours and all the national tours. Although none of the three of us would be surprised if he did rattle off, you know, three out of the first six events or something like that. I mean, he's obviously that good. Yeah, absolutely. And he's, you know, he's tuned up already. We're, uh, you know, maybe a lot of a lot of our other players have been taking some time off, training, and, you know, haven't, haven't been competitive uh, where their first events are going to be, you know, maybe the week before uh, Vegas. They'll, they'll play, an, play an event, whether it's out in California or New Mexico, where we've, we've seen uh, – Kale Lavisca come out and uh, make his debut. He got his hundredth win there last year. Um, so Chris will, Chris should be uh, finely tuned and uh, oiled up, ready ready to go for when the season starts. And it's that's going to be one of those fun ones to watch. And uh, you know, unfortunately for Chris, someone else from from the southeast, he's he's going to have to be seeing uh, a little. He's going to be seeing a little bit more often out there on tour. Calvin Heimberg. Um, I'm going to get to him in a, in a couple minutes, but, uh, yeah, the, I could see Chris winning, but then man, the competition is going to be stiff this year. Uh, but let's, let's go ahead and finish up with King's cup and then, uh, we'll get into, uh, young Vinny and others. <clears throat> so, as I said, Kenneth Tiberski, Tiberski, uh, got the win in the pro masters. They had 13 total players, open women, Debbie Scott. Played some pretty good disc golf and uh, got herself a victory. 
she shot uh she popped a couple 900 plus rated rounds there so nice shooting to debbie on the open side only 13 players but as i said we had uh the likes of hastings schultz and uh the 2018 usdgc breakout nathan queen um and uh, at the end of the day, Nathan Queen, the lefty, was able to hold off Barry by four throws. This was a four-round event. Nathan Queen, 999 rated currently, went 1052, 1039, 1042, 1045. Uh, so he shot some pretty darn good disc golf. And Barry, Barry was only four throws behind him. So Barry, Barry was also playing uh, some pretty strong disc golf above his 1025 rating. And uh, finishing in third was Dan Hastings. He was at uh, 17 under. So he was pretty pretty far behind uh, Barry and ultimately Nathan. So uh, pretty pretty good shooting there by Nathan. Uh, looks like he's uh, he's going to be making it out out west for the, the first uh, national tour of the year. He'll be, he'll be playing the, at Vegas and uh, also will be at the Memorial. So we're going to see. We're going to see a little bit of Nathan Queen on tour. Uh, it looks like his rating did change since uh, since that event. He is now above a thousand at a thousand two. And uh, if you're wondering, he's played 140 events and he's won 36 of them. I don't know how many of those wins are in the MP MPO division, but uh, clearly he's got game. And uh, yeah, he's going to be another person out there uh, out there testing the road. Uh, real quick, what is, has Dan Hastings officially transplanted? Is he down in that area, or is he just down there now playing golf? Because he's a he's a isn't he an upstate New York guy normally? Yeah, I think this this might be the third year uh, he's been living in North Carolina. Um, I, I want to say he's a teacher, and so mm. that's why we see him traveling a little bit more over the summer. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain that he now lives in North Carolina, and this would be the the second or third. Uh, year that that he's been down there okay I say down very cool new york <clears throat> so congratulations to all the winners there uh i'm gonna go ahead and hold off on uh the maricopa Mar open yeah presented by Dy dynamic discs i will uh i'll touch base on the pro masters uh pete ulibari uh Got himself an A-tier victory, or no, excuse me, a B-tier victory, because that was a B-tier all around. Um, shooting some really good disc golf. Uh, Pete recently, like his brother Paul, switched to Discraft, and uh, yeah, he had a couple, couple solid, solid rounds there to get himself a five-throw win. Speaking of solid rounds, Katrina Allen, 11-throw win over Callie McMorrin, and Callie is from Arlington, Tennessee, and Callie played pretty. She played pretty good disc golf. There was five total women, and, and Callie actually uh, beat Jen Allen by. Boy, I'm gonna have to get my calculator. Seven throws. Wow, um, Jen's been shooting really well lately too. Yeah, yeah. Jen just uh, shredded. Uh, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but she played some really good disc golf, and she didn't play all that bad this weekend. Uh, Jen Allen went nine fifty one, nine oh three, and then. Did not make the cut to the final round here, where Kelly went 9.33, 9.69. But neither of those were, were even close to Katrina. She went <laughs> uh, 61.51, which was 9.51, 10.25. Wow. Uh, a little, uh, little 10.25 action to go, and then finished it off with a, a 9.82 rated round. So uh, pretty pretty good. I, I saw Kat posted on social media that she uh, – was a little nervous. She hadn't been playing very much this winter. Had mostly been training, but uh, it seems like uh, the rust came off pretty quickly there. And uh, you know, Katrina found herself uh, one for one on the year in the winner's circle. Yeah, of course, a very solid performance by her, uh, and, and you would expect that uh, of you know such a, such a seasoned pro. Like you said, even with a little bit of rust, uh, it's hard to bet against Katrina. And and like you mentioned, there was the cut to the forty-ish or fifty-ish per uh, cut, 
40 or 50 ish uh, percentage uh, from Saturday into Sunday's play. In that case, there was five women, so they cut uh, to the top two, and it became just Katrina and Callie. So uh, a, a good battle, uh, but just if, if, it's hard to keep up, though, when you're talking about Katrina putting up a 10 25 rated round, playing very solid. And that was the afternoon round over at Maricopa Meadows, I believe. That was her second round. Is that correct? Yes, that was the second yeah. round. Okay. So we'll we'll talk with AB a little bit more about that and some of the details about where they played and all and uh, the configuration and the new course that was in play this year. All uh, really good stuff that we'll get uh, a little more insight out of AB from. But uh, as you said, congrats. And congrats to Pete. Uh, you know, like you said, his brother uh, switching, him switching, and then that's his first ever Masters event. So he turns oh, wow. 40. Uh, I want to say he, I thought he said it was in May. Uh, and so he's just going to be turning 40 later this year. Uh, we've, we rave about him all the time, how talented of an individual he is. Uh, but then he goes out and takes down his first ever Masters tournament and uh, one for one in that category and with brand new plastic. So uh, mm-hmm. congratulations to uh, Pete on a really solid performance out there. Yeah. Pete and Paul both. Uh really good people uh enjoy spending time with both of them so uh let's uh let's move all the way down south to the 18th annual southwest florida open presented by sun king uh 87 total players there was no fpo division they had uh they did have a 40 plus mpo and uh or pro masters 40 plus excuse me and scott jones uh, got the win there, but let's uh, let's jump up to the open division. There was only 12 players, and uh, if you looked at all the ratings, you probably would would have guessed. Well, actually, maybe not, but uh, you would have guessed that these two would be up at the top. Uh, Cal- I'm speaking of Calvin Heinberg and Charlie Goodpasture. Um, also, would have guessed that maybe uh, Johnny McRae might have been up there, but Looks like he was unable to finish the event. Um, again, going by social media, I think uh, I think Jen was sick and uh, maybe another family member had pneumonia. It sounded like Johnny had a lot of things going, um, but he also had a couple sub thousand rated rounds, rounds one and two, but had a, had a lot going on the personal side and then ultimately did not finish the event. Uh, but finishing the event and finishing it in a, Extraordinary fashion, Galvin Heimberg. Um, kid's good. I, I, he is good. I said it on the so podcast good. earlier. I think, A, he's going to be the, I don't want to call him a surprise, the biggest surprise of the year, but because he's clearly not sneaking up on anybody with these scores, but I think he's going to be Innova's top player this year. If you took all the all team Innova, and, and you took all their wins and money earned, if he tours as much as I hope he does, I think he's going to be their top player. So you put, wow. put him over the Throwing ring. Throwing shade remember, at Barsby, like, Sexton, Cole, All of them. Conrad, Wysocki, Johnny V just slashing. What was that, Dana? <laughs> I said I was trying to say uh, you remember Wysocki is on Yeah, Innova I remember right all now. of them. I've looked at the team, okay. and I, I think Calvin is going to have the overall best year of all of them. He's going to he's going to be the one that – he might not be the most consistent, but I think he's going to get a big win before – maybe before any of the other guys. And I, I, I think he's – he is just so smooth and good. And I think he's got that young <laughs> – that that young man's kind of passion right now that some of the other guys maybe don't. So that's that's my take. My take is Calvin uh, is going to be tops at Team Innova this year, and we're gonna see what happens. I like that, yeah, Johnny. He, I like that. It's bold, but I like it. He he just exudes passion <laughs> and enthusiasm. Yeah. He's just oozing <laughs> all of it what, all the time. When you right, look Dana? at Calvin, he screams. <laughs> Uh, passion, <laughs> the, yes. the most down to earth, quiet, subdued I, guy. 
I but. get him and, and Nico confused all the time out on the course. Like, <laughs> which which somewhat curly-haired guy is that out there on hole seven right now? Nico I can't tell by the like, mannerism. Nico comes up to, like, Kelvin's waist. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> no, that's, uh, that is good. And and I think everyone's excited to see it. Obviously, uh, Innova is, is, I'm sure, excited to see what he's going to do out on the tour uh, traveling more, playing more, are going to be at uh, a ton of events this year. Um, and, and I don't think your take is entirely crazy, Johnny. No. Uh, he, there's no doubt he's going to do well. Just how well? Will he be tops at Innova? Uh, that, that's a pretty bold take. But, um, you know, you've said dumber things. I have said so. a lot of dumber things. <laughs> and this is not even in the top ten of the dumbest things I'll say no, this year. No, no, I'll give you that. <laughs> no, this is that- <laughs> This might even be good uh, a, a good call there, Johnny, because uh, because Calvin is he is the real deal. So let me let me run through what he did this weekend. Uh, he started out the round with a ten forty six uh, that that beat Charlie by four throws, but then round two he went forty two, uh, which was ten eighty eight rated. Charlie Goodpasture fifty two, so kind of kind of wiped the floor. Uh, Right there, and then yeah, he final bested the round. whole field by eight strokes that that round. Yeah, round oh. two. Yeah, the, the next best round was uh, Tyler Yeager. Uh, he shot a fifty. So uh, then final round didn't didn't let off. Forty seven, ten sixty five rated. He he won by I don't know nineteen throws. Um, pretty pretty good stuff. And uh, man, he's up to ten thirty nine. And uh, it's not going to be a big surprise to you know see this next up ratings update in the spring. He's going to be, he's likely going to be ten forty plus, and uh, from there, where we'll see we'll see where he goes. But if you click on his name on uh, pdj.com, Calvin Heinberg, PDJ number four five nine seven one, you'll see he has signed up for a ton of events. He's on tour this year. Uh, Let's, let's hope he uh, stays healthy, continues to have fun, and continues to shoot well because it's just it's fun when um, you know it's not you know the two or two or three man race. Um, last year we saw some parity, but uh, I'm going to say that we're going to see even more so uh, in 2019 because we got as we talked about earlier, Chris Dickerson, who's a threat to go out and win any event, whether it's a C tier and southeast tennessee or whether it's the disc golf pro tour finals um so that's awesome calvin heinberg he's johnny's pick to be innova's player of the year and then Macbeth, he's got new frisbees in his bag ricky he's back to innova it's we got paul omen still with innova barsby the world champion simon eagle how, how much did paul pay you tonight he's like dude you gotta sneak me into that conversation <laughs> <Gotta> name drop me <laughs> come on oh. paul paul <laughs> you know paul real worried about getting uh, mentioned on on smashbox <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, it's, i think we are gonna see we're gonna see a lot of parody uh with with wins uh this coming season um it's gonna be fun to watch and uh, I, I can't wait for that. We're, I kind of hope we don't. I kind of hope at the beginning yeah, of the season, we see somebody take down like two or three of the big events like Eagle did last year. Because I think that that lit a fire under everybody else to catch Eagle. And if we, I just kind of feel like if we start out the year with a bunch of parody, where, okay, somebody wins one event, somebody wins the other event, new person wins the third event. Oh yeah, there's that fourth really good guy who's going to win the fourth event. To me... It's great. It's great for the sport, but I want to see some guys get fired up. I want to see somebody like get a little bit cocky. I want to see some guys have to chase somebody. And I don't really honestly care who it is. If it's if it's Barsby or Calvin or Paul or Ricky, just come out of the gate. Someone needs to come out of the gate really hot and win like two of the first three events. Paul Oman. Yeah, Paul Oman. Where are you at? The third then Paul. Kale, then, you know, his <laughs> travel partner, Kale, he's he's always – there's there's a lot of good players, and uh, 
you know, we're seeing players take uh, take these off seasons uh, a little bit differently than say five years ago. So uh, presumably they're getting better and better and smarter and uh, yeah, just a, a good a good time for disc golf and a, a great time to be a disc golf fan because we've got so much great coverage out there every, every weekend. Um, and seemingly we're gonna we're gonna see even more events this coming year, more cards at each event. I think Vegas, uh, Terry. We saw an announcement that you'll you'll be at, at the Las Vegas Challenge, uh, going FPO two, aka Chase Card for the women's pro division. Um, how do you know how many cards are getting covered on on the men's side? Uh, I believe they're working to have three, and so uh, to to try and continue to. You know, of course, it's not going to be exactly equal uh, in terms of they're doing it more of a percentage style, but they're looking at three on the MPO side, at least two on the FPO side, uh, and then going from there. So, and and one has to ask, and, and we we can't dwell too much longer. I think we got Anthony uh, in the green room, but um, one has to then start thinking about: um, is is there a little challenge? Has has there been a? Uh, a challenge between how the national tour has been doing their coverage for the last you know, few years and, and now the pro tour who has really shaken things up on the media side in this off season, is that a, a window or a door of opportunity for the national tour to say, Hey, we see the pro tour has been uh, really excelling in terms of having so much media coverage. And now they're, you know, going with a whole nother plan to make it, uh, you know, ideally even better and now we see the national tour, at least at this opening event, uh, looks like they're uh, putting a little bit more into it on that side. And I'm glad to be a part of that one as well. So um, that was something that kind of came to me. I had a great conversation with Sarah Holcomb before the show as we're trying to figure out a plan for things like FPO chase card. Like that hasn't been much of a priority or a concern. And this year, I, it looks like I'm going to probably uh, take it on largely myself to make it a priority. So um, it's, it's all great to see it all evolving and, and hopefully elevating. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, it's, it, it's great. And uh, hopefully, I, you know, with so many great players out there, it's going to be important to have these chase cards on film because uh, there's been some events in the past, some big ones where there was only uh, video coverage on the, on the lead card and, you know, people from the second card come charging and how, how terrible would that be to have this huge event where Calvin Heimberg comes from the second card shooting a you know a ten ninety in the final round and, and beats everybody on the lead card and but you can't see it or you, there's yeah. cell phone footage of it or Instagram footage of it so uh, I think it's going to be even more so important to have those uh, second and third cards covered and you know they're going to be stacked with players too there's going to be lots of views for. Lots of views to go around, lots of disc golf to watch. Um, I don't know if I've said it, but I'm excited. It's going to be a great year for sure, Dana. All right, pal. Well, we're going to cut you loose. Uh, we appreciate all the info. I know we got Anthony uh, off on the uh, in the waiting room ready to go, and uh, it's going to be great to catch up with him. It's been a while, and I'm sure you could learn a thing or two from the young gun, the 19-year-old. You've watched him uh, you know, come into disc golf and evolve and now you know he's a contender everywhere he goes uh what's the one thing you want to hear from anthony borello what, what do we got to make sure to ask him yeah i just want to hear about um what he's going to do differently being on tour than mm. from what he's done in the past um how that how he's how that's going to change him or change his game or his approach Okay, that's uh, that's a uh, very legitimate question. Him, like Vinny, uh, going to be out there a lot more this year, and uh, we're looking forward to talking to him. So, all right, Dana Mite, well, you stay warm, keep that family warm, uh, don't go anywhere unless you have to. All that good stuff, get that fireplace up and running, and uh, hopefully everybody stays healthy and and warm over at the house, pal. Hey, glad you got to see me. See you next time. Good to all have right, you back. Take Dana. care. All right, Dana Mite Vichy giving us a little insider uh, info from around the tour. Uh, Johnny, as we alluded to, and we'll talk with uh, Anthony here in just a few moments, I didn't get a chance to see everything else going on around the country with traveling out to Arizona and back. Uh, but 
certainly uh, feeling like these weekends are now starting to fill up. Pretty soon they're going to be littered with A tiers. We're going to be talking national tours, talking uh, pro tour stops, then sprinkling in a major here and there. Uh, it's it's just around the corner, just a few weeks away. So pretty huge, cool stuff. Huge, huge shout out to Chris Rodriguez for dropping a fifty dollar super chat. Holy on the board. cow! The color pink. It's my favorite color. Yes, we love that. Well, thank Chris, you very much, Chris. We appreciate it, buddy. We know that Chris is working on some stuff right now. He's doing the La Nina, as he's talked about. Uh, he's working with Dynamic Disc, who's helping support the event. And they're selling, I think, 10 of his baskets, even though DD makes their own baskets. Well, Chris does as well, uh, El Guapo baskets. So if you buy one of those, you're actually supporting the event. Um, and they're going, you know, he's working hand in hand with DD on it. So uh, make sure you go check it out. Find him on Facebook. Uh, Chris, we appreciate the support here at Smashbox, but go check out the La Nina Open. Uh, it's part of the West Coast Swing. Uh, he's doing everything he can to get as many of our top-tier women, and all women, doesn't have to be top-tier, but he's trying really hard to make that one of the premier women's-only events. So please go check that out. Chris has also been a big supporter of my video blogs on, obviously, of Smashbox. So uh, go check it out. ASAP. La Nina Open. All right, is Fueled Anthony, is Anthony on Skype? Do I need to dial him up? Uh, let's double check. What's your Skype? Oh, have, that, that he was, just needs to log to in. I believe we've chatted with him a little over a year ago. I've got him in my contacts. So I just don't see him online. If he can log into his Skype account, we can get this thing rolling. Okay. Uh, and Anthony out in Arizona. Um, and hopefully he's going to be all logged in and ready here to go in just a moment. Um... Kids these days, you know, I think about this often. Like Skype, is <laughs> Skype older than Anthony? Because Te it, it's got to be. Technically, it's got to be close. Technically, not Skype. Skype was purchased. Skype, Microsoft purchased another company, which actually ended up turning into Skype. But I think the actual original bones might be older than Anthony. No, Anthony's twenty. No, not quite. Skype isn't quite that old. Uh, it's pretty cool. I, I remember getting Skype for the first time ever uh, a couple of apartments ago. He said that he sent you a message on our Smashbox TV Skype there, Johnny. So if you look on there, maybe you can, and maybe it's not coming through because we're already oh. on a Skype session. And... Okay, yeah, he has he has a new Skype account mm. then. So I have it. Go and, ahead, dial it. And I will. We'll dial see it. what happens. Things. <laughs> we locked Terry right up. So we're going to see how this goes as we dial Anthony Barella up. Yeah. So we're not getting Anthony quite yet. Terry, are you back there? I am here. Uh, I was, I was not, yeah. I was, not able to get, I was not able to get Anthony. I called the... He says, call again. Call again. All right, here we go. <laughs> this is a little bit better video shot of Terry. All right. Let's see if... Now let's see if we can... Uh, see if we can get this figured out here real quick. Uh, I think I can just... Merge these two calls. Uh. All right. Uh. Any any luck? Oh, hold on. Meanwhile, I'm trying to stabilize my uh, laptop so that it doesn't shake violently every time I try and type something. Oh, hold on a second here. We'll get this, folks. Don't worry. Oh, Anthony, I'm going to give you a call back here. Just one second.
This is fun. It's this new Skype. I'm not a big fan of the new Skype. Hmm. Uh, hold on a second. Because I have to... It's strange. I have to add the call. You know what I'm going to do, Terry? I'm going to hang up the call with you. I'm going to call Anthony, and I'm going to join you to the call. All right. I'll be here waiting. All right. I know you will. All right, folks. We're going to get this working, I promise. All right. So now we have Anthony. Anthony, I just need, I need some video from you. Uh, click the little uh, camera icon. There we go. And now I'm I'm calling Terry up. Should, should have Terry here in a second. I said I'm adding Terry. And I really call. love that music when it's ringing me, and I just want to like. <laughs> you guys right. should hear what that sounds like. It's pretty cool. All right, so we got that, and now we've got that i think let's hope that we can johnny v pressing buttons folks i i i, I truly am i'm uh we're gonna, <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna make this happen sounds like i can hear anthony in in the distance can you guys see me yeah uh, I, I, I i can see you the the rest of the world can't yet and i oh I, no no it's it's not that's not you that's me okay it's definitely me it's not you, it's me, Anthony. Some some young lady will say that to you someday. It'll break your heart. <laughs> oh, break your heart. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, everybody. For now, we've got Anthony's audio. I'm going to work on getting his video. So uh, for now, let's just, we'll have Terry do a little bit of interviewing like we normally do. And I'm going to work on pulling in some video. But Anthony, welcome to Smashbox. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. So, uh, I, what was it? Has it been a year or longer, maybe, since we've had you? It's been a while, isn't it? Uh, it's definitely been a lot longer. It's It was like right after I won AM Worlds, I think. Oh, my gosh. Way back in 2015. So yeah, like three years. Holy cow. Well, it's way too long. Well, g thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, and I already kind of told the story that, you know, after Shelly Sharp, you had obligations, so you couldn't join us then. And I just said that you should win again. And, well, here we are. So uh, that worked out for you. Oh yeah, it. Um, yeah, it definitely helped out because I was busy like two weeks ago. <laughs> oh, there we go. Can you guys see me now? Uh, I got, uh, I've got I've got Terry's video. Still working on yours though. Don't worry. It's, oh, okay. it's, it's definitely okay. on my side. So. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you, you were busy. It didn't work out, but, uh, let's recap. Let's talk a little bit about this weekend. We already kind of, uh, talked about, you know, Pete Ulibarri's first win as a master. We talked about Katrina and her insanely good play. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about what we saw on your side, uh, new courses. So let's start there. Uh, copper sky is what you guys played on Saturday morning. And then after the cut took place Saturday afternoon, uh, when you the people that made it back came on Sunday morning and went back to Copper Sky, so three rounds over the uh, over the two days, right? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about Copper Sky, brand new course, you know, in that area down in Maricopa, ten minutes or so from the other course. Um, they've seen a lot of that footage throughout the years. How do you compare Copper Sky to the other Maricopa, you know, homeowners course? Um, I think they're pretty similar in how that i attack them it's a lot of hyzer shots on both the courses but maricopa meadows is definitely a lot more fun to play because it's cooler and the copper sky is similar to like my home course emerald park just like that dead grass look and all the open hyzers so sure now is it fair to say and i've i've edited together most of the footage from the weekend and when i look at both courses and you talk about the hyzers and and being relatively open for people that haven't been there, is is it hyzers for everybody, or is it just hyzers for big arms? How do you feel about that? Um, I'd say it definitely favors the bigger arms. Uh, they're all about like 350 to 400 foot like hyzer shots. So I threw a lot of destroyers and T-birds out there. So yeah, yeah, not a lot of uh, stuff to play around, so to speak. And that's um, you know no rip on the courses whatsoever. It's just it's kind of what the landscape offers, right? Yeah. What would you say, uh, 
without getting too far off topic, what would you say is a course that's unlike what we typically see? So, you know, if you came to Arizona and were like, okay, this one course or these two courses aren't like all the other courses, where do you have to go to find those? Um, I'd say you have to go up north, like more towards the woods in the Flagstaff area. Okay. So, like, Pearson and Thorpe, those are pretty cool wooded courses. It's nothing like it is down here. Yeah, and some of those we saw at AM, uh, well, AM and Pro Worlds 2003, 2005. Uh, yeah. very, very different look up there for sure. Yeah. Now, uh, Copper Sky, relatively new. Have you had a lot of practice out at that course? Um, I probably played about four rounds of practice out there before the tournament. So, yeah, a few. Enough to, like figure out my game plan and stuff. And uh, when you go out there and practice, were you doing that? I mean, you have a, a whole family that plays disc golf. And then, you know, Yuli and Waisaki are in town, and there's other people around. Who are you typically going out and playing with? Um, for my first couple rounds, I was playing with my family and some friends. And then I went out there with Paul and Ricky. And, yeah, and then I've just been playing with them for the past week, I think. We've been playing, like, every day, so it's pretty fun. Now, uh, a question, and I think it's pretty fair. You, you of course, won this weekend, but one of the questions that kept coming up is, well, Ricky's in town. He lives there. Why is he not playing the Shelly Sharp? Why is he not playing Maricopa? Do, do you know, or do you not uh, even ask him? You're like, no, that's okay. You don't need to bother. <laughs> no, I always ask him to play because I want to beat him, but he always <laughs> says, uh, he says he's not ready to, like, play with his new Innovatus, and, like, I think... I think that's a lie because we just played Fountain Hills like two days ago and he shot 16 under. Really? Yeah, he beat me and Yuli by a lot. So, yeah, he's definitely a liar. <laughs> Maybe he's just scared of you. Honestly, that might be the thing. I beat him today at Vista, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, you, I assume, I mean, you have to do some trash talking at that point, right? Oh, yeah, it's all trash talking with me and me, <laughs> Paul, and Ricky on the course. <laughs> uh what uh, what what kind, do you guys do uh, bets or side games or a anything else outside of score? Uh, yeah, we usually play five dollars a stroke. So wow! Like, it keeps you in the game because it's like if you blow up, you can't just like throw away around. You just got to keep trying. Uh, what? Well, Hundred bucks or something? Yeah. Yeah. What was second best score to Ricky sixteen though? Uh, I think Paul shot eight under and I shot six under. So that was not, that was not a good day. <laughs> no. Uh, did you keep them all out of the water? Uh, I think I threw one in. Uh, yeah. so, uh, I think a, a relatively fair question to ask, uh, of you is, you know, we saw, uh, Macbeth, of course, go, uh, from Innova over to Discraft. We've seen Yuli now move from Innova over to Discraft, and Pete, just the same, uh, you know, that, that kind of Arizona contingency. Dan Ginley has been with Discraft for 300 years, I think. So uh, w was there ever a consideration for you uh, to possibly move, or did you even think about it? Did you ask around, or was that conversation ever had? Um, I was definitely asked to, like, consider Discraft and stuff, but I never really saw myself moving over there. I just want to stick with Innova and, like, paved my own road and stuff so yeah do you feel like a lot of people because of your stature your size and then your form uh even a little bit of your attire you and i talked about this after you won worlds uh you know you were kind of dubbed a mini Macbeth for a little while even though you probably yeah. are like a foot taller than him now um do you feel like that it, you're totally fine with that separation like you said paving your own way and and, you know, what, maybe going on to become your own your own superstar, so to speak? Yeah, I definitely want to, like, break away with, from that. Because, like, everyone just calls me Mini Macbeth, and it's, like, kind of <laughs> sometimes. I think it's kind of what? I think, I think they're calling you weird. Tall Macbeth now. <laughs> I think yeah, it's Tall Macbeth. Tall That's Macbeth. What, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, understandable. And, I mean, obviously you're having your own successes, and obviously – you can contend with and or beat him i would say on any given weekend uh is, is that a goal as you go on tour this year oh yeah my goal is to beat him a few times <laughs> yeah. i've definitely talked to him about it and like just some trash <laughs> talk i'm gonna try to beat him this year how how does he feel about that what is does does he, he give it right back 
I texted him something. I was like, I'm going to, like, crush you this year or something. And he's like, I want you to succeed, but don't get too far ahead of yourself or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's typical, typical Paul <laughs> trying to keep it realistic. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. So what if, is your what is your tour schedule gonna gonna look like? I mean, where where are these spots you're going to beat him? It's definitely we're I'm gonna be touring with Adam Hammies and we're gonna be doing the full tour. We're gonna hit all the big tournaments and stuff, and squeeze in a bunch of A tiers. So yeah, it's definitely gonna be a full tour for us. Hey, and so let's uh, just thinking ahead. Uh, w you'll be at winter time in a couple weeks or no? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so w you, the obviously then it's got to go. Wintertime Vegas Memorial, and then will you take about two weeks to get over to uh, Waco and then just continue on in Texas? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, that seems pretty, uh, that seems like a pretty good plan. Uh, yeah. How'd that come about? Uh, you know, do you and Adam have a history together? Uh, I met Adam in like 2015 Worlds, and then we've just stayed in touch, and then I toured with him for like two months i think in the middle of last season and that was pretty fun so we're gonna do it again now I, you like adam and like a number of our other players like had things like high school to, to worry about and to get finished up um what, what's that conversation been like with your parents who are very actively involved they play golf they've uh themselves and they've obviously supported you but what was that conversation like when you started talking about, you know, your next move, whether it be more school or touring full time or whatever? What were those conversations like? Um, they've definitely always been fully supportive of what I want to do. So when I told them I want to go out on tour and like see how it goes, they were all for it. So, yeah, that's awesome. Now, uh, quick side note, I saw your mom who tried to catch up with us during uh, the, the round. <laughs> And uh, she kind of was hobbling along. What I, I, I didn't get a chance to ask her, what, what's her injury? Uh, she got surgery on her ankle and her toes. So, yeah. Uh, she's okay. been out for like a month now. And she's just getting able to be walking again. Okay. And uh, hopefully her recovery has been going well. And yeah. when, when is she going to be able to play again? Um, I think she was thinking about playing this weekend, just doing like standstills and stuff. But in the next few weeks, she should be back. So give everyone an update uh, about your family in terms of who plays, where they play, you know, how much they play, all that kind of stuff. Um, like my closest family members, like my grandpa, and my cousin, uh, my mom and dad, we always play like probably two, three times a week. And then all my other family will like jump in like once a month probably. We'll get a group of like 10 people playing. And then you guys, I mean, you're in a, you don't just play casually. I mean, your dad was playing this weekend. Your grandpa was playing mm -hmm. this weekend, right, in the tournaments? Yeah. Uh, that's got to be pretty cool because a lot of yeah. – I don't know if there's a lot of kids that can say, oh, yeah, my, you know, my parents or grandparents are actively, competitively playing this weekend as well. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, we always try to do like a grandfather, father, son swing, but they can never <laughs> hold <laughs> – yeah, that kind of sucks. <laughs> They're totally slacking, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Any wagers with them ever? Uh, no. <laughs> well, sometimes I'll give them like 10, 15 strokes, but I always smoke them. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you and Adam traveling this year, what is, I mean, everybody, everybody is doing a sprinter van and, and building them out. What are you guys going to be touring in? Um, we're going to be touring in my Hyundai Tucson for the first part of the year, and then Adam's Trailhawk for the second part of the year, his car. So just okay. cars for us. And uh, do you have places you plan to stay uh, at people's houses or hotels or camping? What's kind of the plan? Oh, uh, yeah. We usually just stay with people's, like, people his, like, houses and stuff, or we'll get, like, a hotel if we have to. What would you say is the number one... Uh, concern or worry that you have at this point as you guys are going to go out on tour in a couple weeks? Like, what's the thing you, you think about the most? Um, probably the car breaking down or something. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Should that be a problem or you're just saying it might? I don't think it would be, but like, <laughs> yeah, that would suck. 
Uh, are you or Adam handy uh, mechanically like that or no? Uh, no, not really. I don't know about him, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, what's the number one thing you're worried about in traveling with Adam? I mean, you said you spent a couple months with him, but uh, give us the dirt. What are you, what, what's the pet peeve or the thing you're most worried about? Um, like, <laughs> he likes to freak out a lot when he plays bad. <laughs> <laughs> he okay. might like, try to quit or something but it's it's mostly just funny because he always like threatens to go home <laughs> <laughs> well maybe you'll be a nice anchor that he he at least won't be able to quit because he knows he'll oh, yeah. have to he, he has to bring you somewhere exactly <laughs> <laughs> all right and what what would what does he not know about you that uh that there should be a fair warning about Something, something that maybe he hasn't realized about you. Um, I have no idea, honestly. Probably Are you like, after like a bad tournament? I get really frustrated, and he like he like he likes to push my buttons sometimes. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so maybe maybe we'll throw a few fists around. Yeah, that would nope. be. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> just uh, let me record it because uh, i think people would be entertained by that right. um now, now speaking of recording do you either of you plan to do any kind of uh vlogging or photos or documenting of the of the process or anything like that um we were talking about doing a vlog so we might do that but yeah i don't know just instagram for now would you say that would you call it out right now and say that if you guys did a podcast, it's going to be better than the Yuli uh, Earhart podcast? Is that what you're telling me? Um, maybe not a podcast, but a vlog, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and did you watch Yuli's vlog uh, that he released uh, or, or whatever that document series was or whatever? Yeah, his vlog. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's got two out now. He just released another one uh, of him playing uh, his, like his first tournament with his Discraft disc. Oh yeah, the Lake Have Sioux Open or something. I was I was in that vlog a lot. I think beating it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's speak a little bit about you know you've played three sanctioned events this year, and you've won two of them. And let's recap quickly how the final hole went. Uh, set up the la the situation for the final hole at the Shelly Sharp a few weeks ago. Um, so it was pretty close, like the whole tournament, like halfway through the round, the final round, me, Drew, Austin, and Paul were all like two strokes apart from each other. And then Drew fell off on the long part four, and then Paul fell off somewhere in there. And so I had a one stroke lead on, over Austin going into the 17th hole, and I threw it like 30 feet short. It's like the shortest hole on the course, the easiest hole. And so I had like a 30-footer. And then I just completely grip-locked the putt, and it went straight out of bounds. So I bogeyed it, and he birdied it. And the new hole 18 at Vista is probably one of the hardest finishing holes on tour. It'll be this year. And so Austin threw it and sawed it off early OB. And then I threw like a spike hyzer to like 25 long, and then... Austin missed the putt, and then I made it to wow. two strokes swing again to take the win. And then uh, we fast forward a few weeks to this weekend, and uh, you come out, you have the hottest round. You shoot a 10 down at Copper Sky. Austin has a, a 9 down, and Yuli has an 8 down. Then you guys go over to Maricopa Meadows, which is the course that you know you said you prefer a little bit more. You played there Saturday afternoon. And uh, you, you, what did, how did you and Austin both shoot on Saturday afternoon? Um, I shot a 49 again, but I think the par was 58 there, so it was only a 9 down. Okay. Austin shot uh, 51, so I had a three-stroke lead over him going into the final round. But and I then had, I only had one stroke on Yuli going into the final round. Yep, Yuli had a, a really good round over there at Maricopa Meadows. Yeah. So then we go into Sunday morning. You guys uh, are obviously in the lead going into that final round. And uh, everything was going along just fine, but it seemed like Austin was just on a tear. Were you thinking at all about his score and what he was doing? 
Um, like, I think halfway through the round, I was like 700 through eight. So I had like a seven stroke lead. Mm-hmm. And then I threw it onto the pile of manure and lost a few strokes there. And then <laughs> I threw it, hit a pole, kicked out of bounds, and put it OB and lost like three strokes. And then I checked the scores at like hole 14, and I realized I was only up one on Yuli and two on Austin. So it was just stroke play at that point, just birdie or lose. Yeah, and then uh, spoiler again, if, if people uh, are, are waiting on the video any day now, that uh, you guys just kept birdieing to finish things out, and uh, there's kind of a double mando on the final hole, and uh, there wasn't really too much drama because you both threw good shots, and... Yeah, that that's how it went down. So, uh, you've got Austin's number along with uh, with Yuli so far this year. Yeah. <laughs> how, how much trash talking with uh, Austin ha- goes down? Um, there's definitely a little bit, like before the rounds and after the rounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, somebody the, had asked, uh, the, and maybe you know this one just like Ricky, um, uh, seeing Cat and Austin. Uh, out on the west coast is that uh also convenience uh having good courses to play or having good tournaments to play uh because some people were wondering like what were they doing so far west yeah i think they came out here just to like get out of like the cold weather Mm -hmm. and yeah their rv is actually parked out out front of our house right now so austin's in there but i think cat's in minnesota right now okay yeah Johnny, did you have something? Sorry. No, I'm good. I was going to oh. say something earlier, but uh, when, we, when we're doing the Skype thing, it's always a little delayed and strange. So, but no. Okay. Continue. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> um, when, uh, you, okay, so you guys are going out on, t- uh, what about, uh, and I hate to <laughs> shift the question, but with their RV out in front of your house, I, I think it's a valid question. Uh, do you know what their plan is? Are they going to be doing the exact same kind of tour swing that you're planning on doing? Um, they're doing wintertime Vegas and Memorial, but I don't know what they're doing after that. Okay. All right. What, uh, what event would you say you're most looking forward to that you've kind of seen from afar that you haven't been at, but what one will be new to you this year that you're most looking forward to? Um, probably, uh, definitely the glass one open. I want to play that one because last time I was there was, 2013 AM Worlds when I won the 13 and under. So I definitely want to go back to Emporia Country Club and play. Yeah, four rounds in Emporia Country Club this year. Uh, fair to say that course suits you quite well from what you've seen? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, so for those who haven't seen you play or maybe are familiar with your game, uh, explain your game, what you feel like is your strong suit, and explain kind of your, your game or your style to everyone. Um, I definitely play aggressive and I run everything basically. Every putt, <laughs> no matter what's behind it. You'll see that in the video when I put out of bounds a few times. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh and then uh, fair to say that you're one of the longer throwers in the game. So <laughs> I know everyone's got internet distance distance, but uh, when you're talking about at what distance, when you walk up to a hole, are you like, eh, I'm not sure I can reach this? What what length does it have to be before you think that? Um, I'd say probably like 600, 650, somewhere around there. And everything under that, you're like, meh, I, I, I could get there. Yeah, I feel like I could reach every hole, unless it's like straight uphill. Uh, that's got to feel pretty good. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> That's where I gained some of my strokes. And that was going to be my next question. I mean, you talk about being aggressive, which can be really great on some days or could you know, somewhat burn you. You've got plenty of distance. Where do you feel like your game is strongest? And then on the, the flip side, where do you feel like you need to improve? Um, I feel like the weakest part of my game is my shot selection and like playing the higher percentage shots. I've definitely been working that, like, in the off-season. But, yeah, I'm still working on it. So you would say, like, uh, is, is that just a mental thing then? Like, you, you deciding, hey, I, hey, dummy, I should really take this obvious uh, shot as opposed to a different shot? Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Okay. And then would you say that 
that distance is your your strongest suit i mean you're obviously good at it but that might you may not feel like that's the strongest part of your game or do you um i feel like that or my my nova shots i've been practicing with the nova a lot this off season and i definitely used it a ton at the shelly and that helped me uh what about that shot explain to someone where you would use it and why you'd use it um just like the consistency i have with it i'm very comfortable with it so like it's a high percentage shot for me right now so i've been using it a lot and when you're when you're throwing that is that anheuser or heiser or dead straight like what where give everyone a scenario of where you think that's a go-to shot i would say just like a dead straight 250 foot shot okay yeah uh, kind of like when I saw you throwing it at hole four at Maricopa Meadows. Uh, is that four? Yeah, to the elevated basket. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly where I was thinking. Like that was on a rope the whole way, mm -hmm. just dead straight right to the pin. Yeah. Um, uh, do you feel like you're going to miss Arizona golf uh, during the during the summertime? Definitely not. No. <laughs> okay, I, I yeah. thought that might be the case. <laughs> um, when you're when you are thinking about the distance and some of the skills that you have right now, are you excited to get to the more open holes and the the bigger you know courses, or are you excited to go play more wooded courses that have a little more uh, technical challenge? Uh, I'm definitely excited for the wooded courses because it's like I only get to play those a few times a year. So that's always fun to like see those places, but the big open courses like the next tournaments like GCC, those are some of the more fun ones. But yeah, have you played Gentlemen's or sorry the the Las Vegas Challenge before? Yeah, I have. I played it the last two years in open, and then I won the AM division in like 2014, I think. Okay, um, and. Does it mean anything to you that it's in Vegas? Is there, I mean, now that you're, what, you're 19? Does it mean anything to you to be in Vegas? The, I mean, I know you've always lived four or five hours from there only, but is it, are you going to get crazy? Uh, no, probably not. I'm not quite old enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I didn't know if at some point, um, you know, you and, you and Adam. <laughs> so if, if, uh, if I were to get a phone call from, we'll say, a police department at any point this year, would it be you or would it be Adam? Which one of you is more likely to get into trouble? Definitely Adam because he's like more of a redneck <laughs> kid from Wisconsin. <laughs> so he gets a little crazy. He'll uh, try to kill an animal or something while we're on the road. Uh, um. Adam loves hunting and fishing yeah. and, and things like that. Uh, do, do you think you guys will find yourself doing any, maybe some fishing in the, in your downtime anywhere? Um, probably not. I don't really like to fish. <laughs> so <laughs> what would you say would be the, uh, where will you guys come to a compromise on things that you will or won't enjoy doing? Like, just like I said, like fishing, I could see Adam saying, hey, I'd love to bring my poles and let's stop, you know, at all these different places. Where are you going to draw the line? What types of things do you see your, yourself not doing? Um, I don't know. He usually doesn't bring, like, his fishing or hunting stuff on the road. Okay. <laughs> so we mostly just hang out with, like, our friends who are also at the tournament, which is pretty fun, but yeah. Okay, so <laughs> hopefully there there won't be too many. Uh, how about cribbage? Any cards? Any board games? Anything like that? Oh, we he likes to play poker, so we play that a little bit. So we'll definitely be playing a lot of poker this season. Uh, I know Waisaki finds himself on a poker table uh, every once in a while. Have you uh, have you squared up against Waisaki? I have not. I haven't played against Paul or, Paul or Ricky yet. Huh. Would you would you think you would have the the better uh, the upper hand so to speak? You think you're a better poker player than them? Um, probably not. I don't have as much experience yet. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else you want to share with us? Uh, you know, for a crazy upcoming season, what what is something that? What are your um, goal? What are your goals for the season? Do you have anything yeah. set for yourself? Like, I would like to win X amount of money or events or tiers, anything like that. 
Um, my my main goal is definitely to get on Joe Miz a few times because I still have not been filmed by them. So yeah, that's what I'm looking at right now. So that would mean lead card uh, at some point, probably at yeah. one of the larger events. You want to at least make it to the lead card. What did you think? And you, I don't think you were logged in yet, but Johnny V earlier in the show said that he thinks Kelvin Heimberg is going to be the uh, in of a superstar of the year because he's going on tour. Uh, what's your hot take on that? Um, I think he'll definitely be up there. He's a solid player and he's really consistent, but I don't know. We'll have to see. <laughs> Calling me out in front of Anthony? <laughs> I, to be yeah. I, to be to be dead to be dead honest, um, I completely forgot about Anthony on the team in general. We were talking about some of the more established names for the tour, like a Coling and a Sexton and a Ricky. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see where where are and I, it's almost crazy to call you guys the young guns because people like Eagle feel like they've been on tour forever, and he just showed up like three years ago. But we've seen guys yeah. like Ricky and Paul and 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 Wysocki and Yuli, they've been on tour for six, seven, eight, nine, ten years now. They're young, but they're the they're the old guys. So having some you and Kelvin and Kevin Jones and some of these fresh blood is going to be really interesting to see and how uh, how all the dynamics go with that. Yeah, I'm definitely now, excited for that. Uh, so new ratings update just came out yesterday. I think Dana might have mentioned that uh calvin i don't know if he's what 1039 right now what did your rating go to mine dropped two points actually uh, yeah. uh two 1017 that was gonna be my guess okay 1017 yeah. um do, do you think about ratings i mean obviously you, i know you want yours to improve but do you have maybe a goal or do you maybe ever say oh yeah by the end of next year i really feel like i should be 1030 or any of those numbers? Um, I don't really have a goal. I just like to like focus on having like a round over like 1060 every tournament. What are some of the things you do to to get yourself mentally prepared for a tournament? Um, I definitely like to play a lot of practice rounds alone before a tournament, just to like get my head in the game and stuff, and then like. I like to do that because it makes it feel like it's like a real like big tournament for me. Because like if I just go out there and play, it just doesn't feel like real. So yeah. Do you have any thing to prove? Do you have any pressures on yourself or anything to prove on tour this year? Um, I feel like kind of yeah. After the hot start I had, so I feel like I have to carry that momentum, but. The momentum's definitely going to help me perform well this year, hopefully. Uh, so as asked on the board, and I think it's a it's a great question, Taylor said, are you planning on the Utah Open, the 303, or the Goat Hill? There's kind of three really, you know, well-established events or what should be big events for this year. Do you plan on going to any one of those three uh, during that first weekend in May? I think I'm going to Utah again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and th that should be a great mix because you're going to see, obviously, that Mulligan's course and then see uh, the, the newer course, which I forget the name of, but the newer course that they're kind of carving out of the woods. Yeah. And then uh, that'll be a good prep for, you know, the 2020 Pro Worlds. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so speaking of Worlds, uh, I'm sure you have your sights set on doing well at the Worlds this year. Uh, talk a little bit about both the Ledgestone, as you'll play in that, I'm guessing, but then also the Worlds. Uh, a few weeks or a few months later, you know, how do you feel like those uh, Lake Eureka and and Northwood Park set up for you? Um, I feel like after like a few rounds of practicing and stuff, I should be able to get it down pretty well. Because last year, the first three rounds, I was just spraying them around and didn't have a good game plan. And then finally, the last round, I like changed it and played like kind of conservative and kind of aggressive. And it definitely, I shot like 10 strokes better. So I'm going to try <laughs> do that uh when you're looking at the uh traveling around this year and playing all these big events do you consciously think about okay i want to make sure i hit eight out of ten pro tours or ten out of ten pro tours or i want to hit all six or seven in the national tours have you thought about it in that way or are you just thinking about individual events 
Um, I mostly just think of like the like the biggest, the most prestigious events, and then Adam just mapped out like the most convenient way for us. So yeah. Okay. So uh, so worrying about like a tour series isn't necessarily your top concern. You're more concerned about the actual schedule and then the events, the individual events, and wherever they fall. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Very cool. Uh, are, are you worried at all about uh, resting or, or a break, either mentally or physically, throughout the year? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I think I'm too young for a break right now, so I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. Well, uh, one of my one of my favorite memories from the memorial many years ago, many many years ago, was after the event had finished up. We're all at Fountain Hills, and they're throwing distance down. I think what used to be I think it was 16. It's right to the side of the like the mini mall or the mini mall there. And there's 16. A, yes, yeah, what's 16 now? And there's some kid who just kept chucking discs, disc after disc after disc. <laughs> it, I think you threw for a good 45 minutes, just as hard as you could, as far as you could. And I, every time I looked yeah. around, there you were just chucking plastic. And all I kept thinking is this kid's arm's gonna fall off. And <laughs> You still got two good arms, and you're still throwing it even further than you were. Ah, you had to be only like 11 or 12 at the time, I think. But Yeah, like 12 or 13. Around yeah, there. it's kind of amazing to watch, uh, to, to know that someone at the time had said, yeah, watch that kid. He's going to be good. And now we have, you, uh, we have you going out on tour. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Uh, and one of the questions on the board was uh, – any kind of tour series disc is Innova. What what level are you on with Innova? I'm on Team Champion, so I'm gonna have the Metal Flight T Bird Three as my tour series disc. Okay, and are those? Do you know if are those available now or when they'll be available? Um, I'm not sure when they're be available. Hopefully, like next month or something. Okay, and then uh, the next question that was a really good one on the board. Uh, do you see the course as your competition, or do you feel like there's people out there specifically that you want to make sure you go out and beat? Who do you feel like is your competition? Um, I feel like no one specifically. I just try to shoot like my best, pretty much. It's bad to like focus on someone else while you're playing. So, yeah. All right, that sounds like the the exact right answer. Uh, what would it mean for you to go out and and whether it's the memorial or Vegas or whatever, what would it mean for you to take down, you know, one of these really big events this year? Um, it would definitely be like life changing probably. So that would be a huge deal for me. Uh, and do, is it fair to say you probably don't care which event you win? I mean, in, you know, like setting a court or I'm sorry, like like beating a specific player, you're probably not concerned. If you just got a big win anywhere, you'd be that would that would be good. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely be happy with that. Um, who do you want to make sure you do beat, though? I know we talked about like Macbeth and and so on and so forth, but like, is there anyone in the back of your mind you're like, yeah, it'd be kind of fun to beat them right away? Um, next week at the winter time, I want to beat Cupcake by like 25 strokes. <laughs> he always talks crap to me. Ever since. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, uh, I think, uh, his dad might be out on the board. I don't know if it's him or his dad on the board and a uh, big smashy. And thank you so much for all the support. But, uh, okay. So Cupcake's, uh, <laughs> there's an X on his back to take him down. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so you and Adam, uh, is there is there any other people that you know will be kind of following your path? You know, I, I, I feel like a lot of these, you know, players are almost in a caravan and that, you know, you see them week in and week out. Is there anyone else that you know, like, oh, they're pretty much taking the same path that you are? Um, No, not really. Like that you've teamed up with or, you, you know, you know that they're traveling or anything? I think eventually down the road we'll, like, team out with someone with an RV or something. Like, we hang out with Jordan Castro a lot, so probably mm -hmm. with him. But, yeah, no one in particular. Um, do you feel like... Let me rephrase that. What do you feel like you're missing out on or leaving behind by going on tour this year? What What's something that, 
um, either you you know you're gonna miss or or you know whether you're happy or sad about it, but you know you're gonna miss out on something or leave something behind. What would you say that is? Um, probably just hanging out with my friends and family is probably the biggest thing. Yeah, it's probably gonna be quite different. I mean, you've uh, played so many events with your parents at it, yeah. you know, or at them, and and I know you guys are all. Uh, you know, your each other's support network. So that's definitely going to be a little bit different. Do you think you'll talk to them every day? Yeah. I usually stay in touch with all of them. That's awesome. Um, any, anything else you want to share with us before we let you go? Um, just shout out Innova, Grip, and Supreme Flight. All right. Innova, Grip, and Supreme Flight. Are you looking for any additional sponsors? Is there... Have you had your eye on any other company or product or merchandise that uh, that you're you're kind of seeking out? Um, not really at this point. No, not not now. Not. Uh, I'm trying to think what else there would be. Shoes, cars, um, watches, well, oh, electronics. I just got hooked up by Body Armor, so that'd be pretty cool. I love right. their drinks. Uh, just, Yuli did. No, Macbeth. Oh, okay. I, I did not hear that. I don't know if I, yeah. I, he posted on his Instagram. They sent him some. Huh. Right. That's cool. I don't think a lot of people knew that. I haven't checked his Instagram recently, so. Yeah. Interesting. Well, not quite an exclusive here, but that's so body armor. That's uh, that's someone that you would uh, yeah. See if you keep outgrowing Paul, you'll never you'll never be able to uh, <laughs> uh, share any of those uh, wares or goods uh, as they come in. All right. Well, Anthony, uh, it, it's great catching up. We appreciate it. Uh, I've got the majority of this weekend's videos edited. Um, I don't know if if you and Yuli could sit down or uh, they just need commentary. And uh, I, would, I would love to get some insight. So hopefully we can find a way to get those commentated ASAP so that we can get those out. Um, but definitely a solid win and very exciting to see this weekend. And Looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Yep. All right, pal. Well, have a good night. We appreciate the time. All right. See you guys. All Thanks right, a lot, care. Anthony. Yeah. All right. The young Yulibari gun. said Yulibari said he doesn't stand a chance on the basketball court, though. So. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I've seen Yuli do some. Uh, some street balling out there. Okay, I don't think it was street balling, but uh, I've seen him play. He's obviously a pretty good basketball player. And Anthony, I feel like, has him by like a foot these days. Oh, most certainly. Huh. Yeah, I'd be interested to see how that battle un would unfold. I don't know how one. good I Anthony is on the court. That's just it. Yeah. I've, I, I've I, got I, Yulabari by, by a foot and a half, but at best I'll be able to block a shot or two, but Yuli would crush me. It's no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, very cool to see uh, Anthony and him going out on tour. I <laughs> I do. It's a funny couple. Knowing Adam like we do, um, he Adam's. A, I don't want to say he's a hothead, but he has. Anthony had mentioned it how he does get upset and he threatens to quit and leave at times, and I think that maybe. Hopefully, some of the things about Mr. Barella will rub off on Hamas, and maybe some of the things from Hamas will rub off on Mr. Barella. So it's going to be a really interesting tour to watch, most certainly. Yeah, it will be funny to check in with those guys. Uh, a pair of 19-year-olds. I know Anthony's 19. Uh, Hamas is either 19 or 20. Uh, so it's uh, it will be kind of funny to see their travels there's trials and tribulations throughout the tour, uh, just growing into their own. And and just think, Johnny, like 20 years ago when we were roughly those ages. Oh, my gosh. The thought of going on tour full time to make a career, to make a living out of disc golf was was just flat out unheard of. It just was not a thing. No, no one no one did. was doing it. And and the, the, the handful of people that we're doing it or we're dabbling in it or thinking about doing it 
were not making like no. we'll say it, real viable legitimate salaries and careers. It, it was basically Stokely who was going around doing it, but he was also doing a lot of uh, a lot of different promotion, either distance showings or doubles events and things like that. The Stokely Double Series, Climo kind of toured off and on, but he would mostly just show up to some of the bigger events on the West Coast. He would his tour was more along the east yeah he i mean he, he was never a, a road warrior and then no barry kind of did it for a while but he he burnt out on that relatively quickly as far as like a full-time tour it, it just yeah, wasn't and even it, yeah it, there just wasn't a cohesive tour in the first place and second of all it just wasn't financially realistic the the players are getting more and better sponsorship from the manufacturers with things like tour series discs the tour is a real actual circuit that you can go you don't you're not driving six days between events or four days between events you can get there in a, usually within a day now for almost every, the next event and the payouts are better yeah it has a very different landscape and the thought that uh, people would go out and and attempt that then versus now, just again, almost inconceivable. Uh, you know, it was right around that 99, 2000 era is when we first saw Dave Felber go on the road, uh, him and the Winnie crew, along with Avery Jenkins, Todd Branch, and Al Shack. And then within a year or two of that, you saw Worm, uh, along with Cam Todd and, and Leslie Herndon at the time, who became Leslie Todd eventually. You saw them in a, on what looked like a tour. Uh, and those were pretty much it, you know. Uh, Jay and Dez kind of traveled around, but not quite as extensively, or uh, with quite that uh, tenacity that we saw, uh, that or that we're seeing now. And it was a uh, very different landscape. So the fact that you have your Paige Bjorkus and you have, um, you know, this Adam and a and a Anthony who are One like making a conscious 15. decision at a young age teenagers or early 20s and saying yep this is what i'm doing and i think you we're going to just continue to see more and more of them follow suit i, I agree crazy. and they're one of 15 different groups that are on tour i don't want to say people they're like one of 15 different vehicles i i hope i hope they get the rvs in front and everyone drafts off of them to save gas so <laughs> Uh, I think Peter McBride, if he's out on tour, I mean, he's probably turning at least 17 or 18 this year as well. Uh, you know, he's one of the younger guys. I'm just I kidding. I, I, love I think that. I just saw his his vehicle, actually, uh, on social media. Yeah. Uh, and I know, and, and kind of the old joke is that I've always talked about just how young. I think it was during a live broadcast of an event. I mentioned that he was like 15, and and far too many people believed me as I was just spewing so uh he obviously looks very young and very talented uh, guy out there so should be exciting to see uh I, i'm gonna quickly recap a few of the uh the the exciting notables and uh and just super amazing people this weekend chris cobb every time i go to arizona he's always right there ready to help out in any capacity so thank you so much to, uh to chris uh, who, who walked along with me uh, throughout the weekend and was ready to help, like I said. Uh, I, I know that I've got a really great human, uh, just a human in Chris, and that every few holes he would hand me a water bottle because I'm not thinking about making sure I'm staying hydrated out there and, and uh, even removes the cap and hands me the water bottle. Uh, I almost feel like I've made it at that point when uh, I've got someone helping me to that extent. So thank you, Chris. I do appreciate it. Uh, and uh, along with that, Boyd Brown, who's been uh, so amazing and such a gracious host to me and, and helped out every time I go to Arizona. He's been a huge help over at uh, First Light, him, um, along with Dan. So I appreciate the two of them. And then uh, I, I had dinner. We went to the Hub which is a new place for us. Uh, Boyd likes to find all the good spots to go to and uh, met up with a couple of gentlemen there along with Boyd. And then uh, Yuli's mom, she came and joined us again for dinner and, uh, and graciously uh, uh, treated me to dinner. So thank you so much, Pat. And 
it's so awesome going to these events and then seeing her. She's got such a great position and that she can go watch Pete. She can watch Paul. Uh, she goes to so many of their events, uh, whether they're local or she has to fly to them and get to them. Uh, it just always seeing her out there uh, as the support mechanism, an additional support mechanism for both of her boys uh, is uh, very awesome to see. So thank you to those guys. Uh, and thank you to Sam, the TD who, uh, who uh, ultimately brought me in and uh, uh, made it all happen and, and lucky disc golf. So I want to Make sure to get all those shout outs in there and there's probably even more, but uh, all those people and, and and Javier, I got to stay with Hav and, and Amy Jo on uh, Saturday night. And for those who don't know, I have history with Hav uh, when, when uh, we, Johnny and I and others, we used to go to Michigan to play all the time in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yes, we're that old. Uh, Javier was was just one of the the godfathers of Michigan disc golf, uh, sporting his bandana uh, out there, throwing an 86 softy, throwing a rock, uh, and is just one of the smoothest throwers to ever throw a disc. And uh, he's also kind of the king of Maricopa disc golf out there. So it was awesome seeing him, staying with him and Amy Jo, uh, very, very gracious host. So, uh, yeah, just awesome. I, I I don't love the idea of like 115 degree heat, but I do love the idea of someday somehow owning something that resembles a, a, a house or a, a getaway or something in Arizona. I mean, there's so much good fall and winter golf that takes place out there. It just feels like the right move that I should I should be out there for weeks or months at a time. So eh, maybe it'll happen. Maybe someday. But like uh, Anthony Barella just said, he he's not going to miss the Arizona summers uh, when he's misses out on those. the tour this year. Yeah, no, <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody misses those. No, so very cool to see. Um, just and just the opposite. We have Wisconsin winters, as we talked mm -hmm. about earlier. We have you know we're, we dipped into the negative fifties with wind chill. C H I L L, mm -hmm. not windshield, wind chill. <laughs> Just in time with a bunch of snow for one of our favorite guests, Simon Lazat, to swing into town. So last weekend, we, you and I both, uh, you more so than me, even got to hang out with Simon for the entire first day that he showed up. He, he just recently put out his blog, his video blog, about his, his really his first day in Wisconsin. Coming in, what you guys did is made a stop at your storage shed. You broke a whippet, and yep. uh, he got to meet your two wonderful daughters, uh, had a few drinks, and then we went to Putting League, and that was all in the blog, so it's a, it's a really good blog. But mm -hmm. what the blog didn't show is then like the next couple nights uh, where he went to the indoor disc golf experience where I swung in and did not play. Instead, I, I, I kind of just jumped in and did some filming for our Patreon supporters. So if you are a Patreon supporter, you should be able to go in there and see some of the lenses, I think they're called. But they're basically short videos that I recorded a few of them. Simon playing soccer at the end of the night with a bunch of with, with some kids and a bunch of players. And, and overall, just a bunch of different shots from the players that night. It was a lot of fun if you ever get the chance. I know there's one coming up in uh, Ann Arbor. I'm sorry, not Ann Arbor. Uh, uh, Rockford. Rockford. I was thinking Anna Page Park, and Anna and Ann Arbor popped to my head. Uh, Rockford, Illinois. That uh, I know Simon won't be there, but it's still a wonderful time. Go ahead, get out of the cold and the snow, and and go check it out. Yeah, it was a, a really awesome week, uh, weekend uh, opener, I should say. As you just said, you know, Simon came to town. I think he said it was his 45th state. He hasn't been to them all yet. He's been to more states than most Americans, which is pretty funny to me. Um, but he's, heck, I don't even know if I've been to 45. It's probably pretty close. And uh, we, he got in on Friday morning, came in from Boston area. Uh, as many of you know, he lives not too far from Maple Hill now. And so when he came in, I picked him up from the airport. And uh, as he said, he's like, 
I, I want to take in what goes on in a regular day. I want to see what's going on here in Milwaukee or, or in this area. And we just kind of did a lot of random things. Uh, we stopped by the Smashbox studio. Uh, he wanted to see that. So we went over to your house and uh, I brought him down into the basement, which is where we usually are. You know, you and I are both located on Tuesday nights. And he, he got a real kick out of that and said it was actually a little bigger than he thought it was going to be. So he got a kick out of that. And then from there, we went to Explorium. Big shout out to Explorium. Uh, for many of those that may recognize it, it's because that is the same brewery here in, in uh, the southern part of, of Milwaukee that uh, teamed up and did the collaboration with Nate and Val Jenkins, Nate Dawes, Val Jenkins, uh, two years ago as well. So... Awesome guys over there, uh, Explorium Brew, Brew Pub, uh, and they're just, yeah, Mike Doble and those guys support disc golf. And that's, you know, if there's a, a you know, a soapbox or to stand on or a, a drum to beat, it's always support those who support you. And Mike over at Explorium supports disc golf. So if you're ever in the Milwaukee area, make sure you go there and uh, tell them you're a disc golfer. They've got discs even, I think, on the walls and for sale. So. It was, it was uh, awesome. You know, we just kind of did a whole bunch of things. First thing, actually, the very first thing we did is uh, I took him to the post office. I'm like, I got this to mail out. And he's like, all right, let's go. So we headed over to the post office right by the airport. And we just kind of got things done throughout the day. And as you said, he met, met my daughters and uh, just uh, vlogged the whole, the whole day. And um, he, I think he had a really good time. He also did a meet and greet in Madison, Wisconsin, about an almost exactly an hour west of me over at the Glide Pro Shop. And he said, I talked to him shortly after it on Sunday, and he's like, I thought four hours was going to be too long. He's like, I had just the right amount of time to talk to all the people, to do all the pictures, and four hours still went by super fast for me. So uh, that was awesome to hear that everybody uh, was warm and welcoming over in Madison. And then as we've kind of alluded to with that storm coming in on Monday, he actually changed his flight and was able to get on a very late night uh, or early evening, I should say, uh, Sunday night flight instead of trying to stick around till Monday morning. And he was able to get out of here. Otherwise he was going to probably be stranded here for an extra day or two. And uh, he was, he was ready to get back and uh, spend some time with his girlfriend. So it was uh, it was it was a lot of fun. And so thank you, Simon. Uh, I'll personally say uh, it was fun to hang out. But then he was also very gracious and it was very humbling. He had a lot of really positive things to say about the work we do, the work I've done, and uh, you know the Wisconsin disc golf scene. And so for all of that, you know, I'm very appreciative as well. Very cool. Um, it was a fun when, time. When, when you talk about uh, the indoor experience, which is which has been held at a soccer complex, uh, usually people come in there starting around what eight nine o'clock, and then that yeah. goes until one or two in the morning. Uh, kind of set it up. Tell everybody you know what they're doing when they're there and and at this experience. So registration uh, goes from about eight to nine. Uh, the way it worked this year. From what I saw from the first day I was there, was uh, anyone that bought a Simon Lazat disc got their name entered into a drawing that was, so you could play with Simon for that round. And really, what it kind of is is it's more of an ace race than anything else this year. They they, mm. they took out the putting because it just kind of slowed everything down. And you play around the soccer complex, which has three indoor courts or fields. Sorry, fields and. Some of the shots are is they're putts, 30 to 40 feet. Some of them are a little longer, anywhere from, I would say, up to, I think the longest one was probably about 230 feet, if I had to take a guess. They're right, right down the center from a, an elevated second floor down to uh, the very other end. There's a whole area where it's very dark, and they do glow. They have one basket that's actually hung from the ceiling, probably about... I'd say 40 feet in the air, and they take the basket part off, so the whole goal is just to hit chains. Mm. And you just you just play around. I think there were 21 holes, or maybe 24. I forget exactly how many. 
you get X amount of points if you if you make it, X amount if you hit metal, at basket and above. And you play around, it goes from nine. I think Simon's group finished up right about midnight. So it's about a good three hour round, maybe a little more. And then there's awards, everybody's just playing. There's rings of fire that they're setting up while everybody does scoring. Like I said, if you watch the Patreon thing, you see Simon and a bunch of the guys playing a ton of soccer. Someone found a ball, <laughs> and obviously there are these indoor soccer fields. So just kicking the ball, there was one boy who was, I think he was probably eight, seven, eight, and he was just having a blast. It was kind of keep away from him for a while. And just Simon has a really fun way of making everybody feel included and just like he, he has your attention. And he was very good. I know he was just... He was, I mean, he's a, he's a lot of fun. He is everything that he portrays on his blog. You know, it's not like he's, yeah, I, I saw him off the blog and on the blog and he's the same guy. It's, it's not like he's putting up a front by any means. Yeah. He's very engaging. Uh, he, he's obviously very talented and skilled. And so if you want to talk darts or you want to talk pool or play him, or you get a chance to like, he's good at a lot of those things and he just genuinely is always looking to have a really good time. And that's like his main objective. And he loves engaging fans and talking to people and answering questions and all that type of stuff. Now, of course, I think as we continue to grow and our players are, there's more and more asked of them on a regular basis. I think that will eventually some of that, shine will uh it'd be harder to keep hmm. so to speak uh but yeah he very much is enjoying himself uh he i think he's enjoying where he is in the sport of disc golf uh, you know we talked a lot about his lifestyle we talked about uh, you know salaries and contracts and the sport and interaction with other players uh you know demeanors on and off the course there's so many there's so many things that when, you know, obviously it's his entire life uh, in terms of being a competitive golfer, but um, th there's so much more to it, as you could imagine. I mean, he's not one dimensional by any means. Uh, of course, disc golf is this major centerpiece, but he's so much more than just that. So it was it was a lot of fun. And, and I think, you know, not to take anything away from him, I think a lot of our players, when when given that opportunity to see more than just what's on the course uh we find that there's you know a lot of amazing humans that we have within our sport so uh hopefully we can see more of that i agree uh speaking of amazing humans i'll make up my own segue there that today uh in among this uh 50 below wind chill or 55 below wind chill whether it was negative 23 or negative 26 plus wind, there was a gentleman, there is a gentleman in Wisconsin. His name is Michael Wright. He's played a number of my tournaments. He's played in, uh, I believe, a number of my leagues throughout the years. Well, what's most impressive is he's played, and he's played 1,400... 1,949, yeah, 1,949 days in a row. Are you kidding? Um, so I went out and found him today. Yeah, 1,949. I had to make sure on that number. So he has not missed a single day of playing 18 or more holes of golf in over five years. And that included today. Today, when it was negative fifty, negative sixty with wind chill, whatever the it worst. was, negative thirty. It was the whatever worst. Whatever it ended up. Um, he went out and played, and I I've known of this streak. I've known he's been playing for a really long time, uh, so I knew of all that. I didn't realize it was quite that many days, honestly. But when I knew that, and then I knew he was going to go out and play today, uh, thanks to Mike Finley, I was able to hunt him down, and then him and I, uh, me and Mike Wright talked. And he's like, yep, I'm heading out there in a little while. I'm like, I've got errands to run on that side of town. And I want to come film it and talk about it a little bit because today was so extreme. I mean, it's just, it's always been a story and it's a great story. 
today just kind of exaggerated that story in a good way that he was playing, even though it's, you know, uh, so cold out. So I caught up with him, walked a few holes with him while he played, did a little bit of filming, and then uh, we sat right there in the snow and we talked for, you know, two and a half, three minutes, and uh, I got a little interview from him. So I was able to put that together super quickly into a vlog. I released it tonight, and so you can go out there and watch it right now. 1,949 consecutive days of playing 18 holes or more and i didn't ask him but i'm just gonna go ahead and say i don't think he has an end in sight like i don't i don't see i mean if you didn't stop today i don't know why you'd ever stop honestly uh he's just getting over mono and uh yeah when it's that cold uh, uh and it didn't stop him i don't like i said i don't know why it would so just pretty of, cool. Pretty crazy. Just think story. of all the days of rain, like nasty rain and wind. Wind. I mean, not so, not even so much wind. I can deal with a little bit of wind. Days like today, I, 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 that is an amazing feat. Like I said, I got off the plane and I was in a parking garage and I was freezing. And I, I didn't, I mean, granted, I just came from Florida, uh, so I wasn't extremely well dressed for the environment, but it was ridiculously cold today. I don't think you have a, a concept until you are actually out in it. And to be out there playing is is a feat in and of itself. But then to think about five years worth of playing. just There is, outside of breathing, is there anything you think you've done for five consecutive years, Johnny, every day? I, I short, can't. short of require like e eating, drinking, and breathing. That's about it. There's not one other consistent thing that I could think of that I have for sure done every day for the last five years outside of like you just said. And, and, and even eating, you think about how often you've been sick. There's probably been, well, I know I've, I personally know I've fasted for 24 hours uh, more than once. So I, I can't even say for sure eating. I guess putting in some kind of either liquid, liquid, um, using the restroom in some capacity and breathing. Those are probably the only three, three things I can think that we have certainly done every day for the last five years. That's incredible. And this guy's played and and it's it not just like he got me. out and played a hole or two. He's playing 18 full holes and that I was me, just going to say that. That's not. Yes. I was just going to say I honestly I didn't know until I asked, asked him during the interview outside today that if it was 9 or 18. I said, "So is that like 9 or 18 or 30?" Like I was just like making up a number, but then I realized how dumb it sounded to say 30, but of course I just left it. Um but yeah, he it's been 18. I, I would have guessed, oh, okay, well, you know, I went out and just got nine in today because I'm on my deathbed, so I'm just going to go get nine in. No, he said 18 holes minimum. Does he usually every play? Every one of those. Because that was Dretzka Park that you were at, if I'm correct. Yep. Uh, does he usually play Dretzka, uh, the course up north, or does he does he mix it up throughout the Milwaukee area courses? Uh, well, right now, and, in, in, you know, some of you know it already that a lot of our courses have been pulled in the area due to a really mild winter up until a few weeks ago uh, or a few days ago. And so there was a lot, there's been a lot less courses to choose from. I think he does uh, try to mix it up otherwise, but uh, now he's somewhat limited as to where he can be going. So, uh, but it, I'll say this when you're out there and there's a fresh foot and a half or two feet of snow on the ground and it's those conditions, the, the one, uh, really big advantages. You you literally are making all of the tracks yourself. So <laughs> finding a disc with a slit in the snow or or whatever uh, is to his advantage. Because sometimes when you go out to a winter course, there's you know a thousand people have played and there's footprints everywhere and it's no, hard to find a disc. No, what's worse is what's worse than when there's only about a hundred people that have played. So there's just sets of foot. If it's a thousand, exactly. it's usually trampled down. Okay. If there's a hundred. You have some people that just kind of go off. So there's footprints over here. There's some footprints over here, but there's plenty of uh, untouched snow. So finding the slit where your disc went in can be miserable unless you, you know, some people will tie ribbons to their disc. 
uh, and things like that. But as I've seen before, in some wooded courses, you put a ribbon on the disc, that ribbon gets caught up by a tree or a tree branch, and that's not as much fun. <laughs> yeah, so he... Out there braving the weather, he said he was fine. And, and I'll say, I, I, me I mentally and physically prepared even to go out there myself. I was fine. But when you're talking about those kind of temps, yeah, those are the things where you, you can get frostbite within minutes or hypothermia within minutes. So you have to be both mentally and physically prepared to be out there. And uh, he was all good. He played 18-plus holes and uh, uh, even sat there for a little chit-chat with me. So... It's out there. It's on the Disc Golf Guy video uh, blog channel on my regular YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, and then I ended even with a little quick winter pro tip for playing golf for those who are crazy enough. <laughs> and yes, as said on the board, uh, when I went live for a few m moments out there as well, you could actually see like the uh, icicles forming uh, the ice chunks that were forming on both my beard and my mustache, as well as even my eyelashes. Like it was that cold out there so nasty stuff for sure but anyway congratulations michael uh it'll be an interesting day when he does decide i, I feel like he's kind of like forrest gump when Just, he was out running yeah like yeah i'm done i'm not gonna play today yeah like what <laughs> yeah gets to, it'll he, be I mean, kind of funny he's two months away from a thousand or i'm sorry two thousand i'm 2000. sorry and at that point is it kind of like do i really want to go to three thousand <laughs> uh or do you give it up? So we'll find out. Well, I'm sure you'll keep up with him, and when he finally does break the streak, we'll we'll let everybody know. <laughs> yeah. So very cool. Um, and and for what it's worth, I know uh, Spencer Wilkin. I believe he's uh, Am World champion from a few years ago. Uh, he had a similar streak. I, I don't know his exact number off the top of my head. I know I've talked to him, and it's been talked about in the past. He had a similar streak of like three or four years of playing at least nine holes in his case. Uh, every single day for a number of years, maybe even somebody on the board remembers. But uh, yeah, to think, I'd love to know this. If there's a longer streak than Michael's, I would love to know who they are. I'd love to have a chat with them as well at some point uh, if they can top 1,400 and, or sorry, 1,949 days. Crazy. I don't believe there is. All right, we have a little bit of PDGA news, uh, not even PDGA news. Uh, so a couple new discs were approved, an oak, a willow, and a bull bay. Uh, that, that in and of itself isn't that big of a surprise, but the company is called Flytech, and I believe these are the first three discs by a new company out of Germany. Mm -hmm. So we have another disc manufacturer in the sport, so just keep an eye out for them. I know that they uh, you can go to the PDGA's website, and they talk all about the three different discs. They've got a fairway driver, a mid-range, and a putter now. Looks hmm. nice and swirly, as all the kids say these days. Later on, I'm going to dab. So. Got to have those swirls. Uh, fair to say, not to retract too much, but fair to say Simon wasn't impressed with the new the new Macbeth putter <laughs> during the, was, the video. I, I saw that. I, I vaguely remember him talking about it. I, I think he was just being silly. And, he was. I know. Uh, I'm just kidding. You know, just getting a kick out of everything. Simon, Simon is that way, but it's, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> for those who don't know, there's a, there's a quick portion in the video where Simon, for the first time actually in my storage facility, he had come across a Luna, one of the new putters that Macbeth is going to be using for Discraft, and he picked it up and uh, looked at it and then said, Ugh, and gave a, a disgusted look of it. Uh, as he was joking around about it. But uh, one thing that I also learned uh, quickly, though, is he, he has such a respect for all of the other players and competitors out there, and uh, he made that so abundantly clear. You know, he's obviously, you know, the furthest throwing player on the planet and one of the most entertaining and lovable and all these other great accolades that you can throw at him. But the respect and admiration that he has for the, for the game – for other people's practice methods. Um, you know, he even kind of jokes all the time about like, yeah, man, you know, these guys work really hard at this stuff. And he's like, and well, and I kind of don't. <laughs> and, I, and, and it's, um, you know, it's not a mockery. It's just, it's funny to think that he knows he doesn't even put in quite the effort that the others do. And I, I think it's safe to say it would be kind of, 
almost scary to think just how good you like if he was disc golf centric uh, like a hundred and ten percent for a full year like everything he did how much better could he possibly be Johnny like if he like I mean, no BSing about it, whether I it's food or diet or training. Like, what do? You, how much better would he be if he gave it a hundred and ten percent every day? I don't know if he would be that much better. Like, I think he his. I'll say this: his driving game. I don't. I wouldn't see that getting that much better. He could work on. Uh, he could work on his forehand a little bit. I'm sure and, and improve that. Uh, it's it's really inside a circle two where I think he needs some help compared to some of the other players. He, he, he isn't as uh, consistent of a putter when he's on look out because he's hitting them from anywhere inside a circle two, but we've seen where he can, his focus can drift and he can get upset with himself. And I don't know if I'm sure there are ways to get over that sports psych psychiatrists or psychologists or whatever. Um, if I, I think if, if there's someone that needs to dedicate, not someone, if there's something he needs to be dedicated to, it is probably that it, it is the, on the course focus. And of course he can improve. We were joking. We were at dinner that night when he ordered the uh, volcano fudge thing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and he, he took a picture of it cause he had to send it to his trainer in, in Sweden. And it's, and he's just kind of like, oh, I'm going to hear about this one. Simon wouldn't be Simon if if that. I, I, can't, I can imagine how miserable he would be. Yeah, it's definitely part of his makeup that he has to be enjoying himself. And uh, that's something that I, I certainly admire about his outlook on the entire situation. You know, he knows, hey, I can, and, and, you know, he's even been somewhat criticized for it or questioned for it, that he could be on a course and he could be like, well, here's the obvious route with, you know, the, the, the shot I should take. But there's the shot that would be far more entertaining. And I like percentage. Yeah, let's go with that one. And I might get 30 more feet on the competition. <clears throat> exactly. So... Um, but like you said, that's what makes him happy. That's what makes Simon Simon. And, and he, he knows it. He knows it within that that's, uh, what's going to keep him happy and entertained. And, uh, in, in hopefully that just pans out for him. And when it doesn't, he seems okay with it. He, he more or less admitted even he doesn't have a killer instinct. You know, of course he loves to win, but he doesn't have a killer instinct within him. So it's uh, kind of funny. Uh, speaking of that volcano, uh, that was one of my least favorite parts of the day. We we are at dinner late night on Friday night, and, and we kind of all agree. I think you were going to get an appetizer, and I was going to get a, a dessert. dessert. It had been a long day. He was going to get a dessert, and we kind of agreed, well, we'll just share. And then uh, two minutes later, after after Simon has served his chocolate volcano you look at him and and say oh so much for you sharing that huh because <laughs> it was just gone he wiped his plate clean and then had no problem using his spoon to come grab some of my apple crisp dessert and then a few of so. my mozzarella sticks <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i think we got the short end of the uh the mozzarella stick so to speak on that one i believe we did ah jerk anyway all right. Uh, I don't know. Do we have anything else in, in actual uh, regular podcast news here? I don't believe so. I, I think we've uh, we've kind of covered everything we need to cover. We can talk about a couple little things in the after show. I know you need to get prepped for your long flight out to Thailand tomorrow. Yes. Thailand, right around the corner. 24? No. 26 hours from now, I will be... Uh, will be boarding the plane and uh getting ready to get out of here skip the country all that stuff so uh yes very exciting all right well we'll go ahead and close things out and then we can move into the after show where we can babble about some other disc golf or non-disc golf related items and uh see what happens from there and we'll interact with the board a little bit more so 
Prey Anthony Barella, thank you for joining us. Congratulations. Two wins in your first three events here in 2019. You can guarantee uh, I'll be watching along with the rest of the world to see how your 2019 unfolds. You and Adam Hammes, excited to uh, see you as your first full year out on the tour. Uh, I, we all know it's going to be a fun uh Fun to watch, and it should be a great experience for yourself. So thank you to Anthony for joining us. Of course, again, thank you to Dana Mike, Dana Vici for the insights. For Johnny V, Terry Miller, the Disc Golf Guy, that's Podcast 232. Stick around for the after show where things will get even crazier. We'll see you then when you step inside the Smashbox. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Smashbox TV, episode 232's After Show. Show. Wow, you you freaked me out. I wasn't there, so I didn't know when we were coming back. Good thing I didn't have my finger up my nose. I waited until you pulled your finger out of your nose. I can see you. Oh, so. oh that's right. Thank <laughs> goodness. Uh, I know I couldn't. Right. There was no good way for me to signal you like, Terry, we're going to come back here in a second. <laughs> so. Wow. Here we are. Well, welcome, everyone. This is the after show. Uh, as I was just calling out, anyone on the chat board that's got questions, please make sure you bring them in and we can address them. There's a little bit of shakeup going on as uh, Sicily, I believe, uh, had mentioned, and uh, I saw it. And I'm very disappointed, and I know the world is disappointed. My, my disappointment is, pales in comparison. It sounds like Yarva Disc Golf Park in Sweden is officially going to become a cemetery. October and, 1st, I think, is the date I saw. Yeah, unfortunately, that probably means I won't get there or ever see it. And what's really disheartening about it for the entire world and me selfishly is many people put Yarva as one of the best courses on the planet. You know, so many of our top pros say that. And with the accolade that it's gotten from the caliber of players, that's really disheartening to, to hear of such news. So pretty crazy. So, uh, yeah, so if you I mean, care about seeing Yarva before it's pulled, what did you just say, Johnny, October? October 1st, I think, is what I saw. Okay, so get there before October 1st. It's unfortunate, but as we know, we're still, even even there, we're still not the biggest priority in the world, and we are, we are going to lose great courses, and we can only hope that we can replace them with even better courses. Yeah, and I, I think about, wow, what a tipping point. What a, what a day that will be when something else gets taken out, something that's of, of in significance or importance, that's taken out uh, so it can become a disc golf course. Just think about when that may or may not ever happen, Johnny. Yeah, I... <laughs> Set up the scenario. Where would this that is... happen? This... Uh, in what condition? What type of... What? How could you see that ever unfolding? I, I, I can't even fathom it right now. Honestly, there's... I'm I'm trying to think if maybe maybe someone having to take out a playground that's already established. Maybe it's a slightly older playground. Uh, take it out for a disc golf course. But and this is going to sound morbid and horrible for me, but I'm going to say it anyway. I just think of all the full cemeteries that we can take advantage of. Just get rid of headstones. And it's I I know it's very bad to say, but I look at these places and I think, oh my god, that. Nobody knew was going in there. Like, 
Is it disrespectful? A hundred percent. Completely. I, I completely agree. And it'd be more disrespectful to go in there and play while they're in there. But I think of the the space taken up by some by things like that, that I'm just like, like wow. And I'm, I'm not... I'm not much one on uh, sentimental things a lot of times. So I, I look at all this, some of these great parks and large areas that could be used for other things. And I just think like, ugh, that, that, I, I, I'm, I respect that they're there and I would never disrespect them. But I just think of the, what we could do with some of that space. I follow what you're saying, and I guess maybe I've never thought of it in that in that exact realm, because when I think about cemeteries, I don't usually think of, typically, them having a lot of trees in the first place. So I don't, I, I think of, but I, I guess it, it depends on the region it or the area that exactly. you're in. But when I think of a cemetery, I usually think it's relatively open with only a couple of trees. So I've never really thought, wow. Yeah, we definitely should have some baskets here, but <laughs> we've got but... <laughs> there's there's actually a few of them in, right around my house, which is why I think of that. We have uh, the, the there, there's one forest home cemetery, which is relatively wooded, uh, okay. and there is one just a little bit further south of me on 27th Street. I want to say it's called Arlington. It's not the National Cemetery, but I think, no, it's, it's... <laughs> I think it's still called Arlington, and it is actually where I, I believe the Boy Scouts go to do some things and and. That is a relatively wooded. It looks more like a city park almost with the type of trees. I mean, it's not heavily wooded, but there's there's plenty of trees there. And I just think I'm like, yeah, yes, I, I I respect everybody and what they what they believe and what they want. I just you it's anytime you walk up to a piece of land, and you're thinking, wow, you could it'd be cool to have a course this close to my house, or it'd be cool yeah. to have a course in this area because some really cool holes could be put here, but. Yeah, I, I I don't see uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon for either of those places or for yeah, society I mean, in general. I guess I, I I usually don't have the mentality of like, man, I wish all these dead people weren't here. I yeah. usually don't think that, but I guess if that's but, and what there you're are some people. To. I mean, imagine this: you take one of these, you take all the headstones out, yeah, and you let it sit for a year, and then you put a disc golf course on it. I think there would clearly be some people that would have an issue with that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, I'm, I'm saying I've... even even if it weren't the families, the families of of whoever's there, <laughs> just in general, we say, okay, this is this is a hundred year old cemetery. No one's been put in here for a hundred years, and we're, we just we cleared out, and and now it is replaced with uh, a disc golf course. Like me personally, I've got no issues. Like cool. So there are some people that I think still would, and rightfully so that they're, that those are their beliefs. But I I'm not of that type of sentimental I mean I don't want I'm not talking fresh <laughs> like like oh guess what you know uh, we need to be out of here by five because they're, uh, <laughs> they're 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 putting they're putting dirt on someone over here I'm not talking that but in in general that's uh hmm. it's my fun after so show is, thought <laughs> so is it safe to say you want to be cremated I uh, yeah I, I don't. I don't see. Because uh, I, I was about to call you a hypocritical mm. sob. Then, if you're, if you don't, well, that, I that's mean, not, that's not necessarily true. I mean, I, I could be buried and, and not care if people are walking all over my grave. I don't. If I'm gone, I'm gone. I don't really care what you do with me, Terry. Put me in your storage. I don't care. <laughs> like stuff me. Like I'm. I'm gone, <laughs> man. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can be like a a. a uh, uh, you can weekend at Bernie's me. I don't really care. Put me in your passenger seat so you can always drive in the, uh, yeah, in, in in the, the lane. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't, again, I'm gone, man. I don't care. Huh. Well, I'll have to think about that. I'll yeah. have to decide what I'm going to do with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm cool with that. All right. A few questions on the board. <laughs> People coming in with uh, talking about uh, live coverage. Uh, we we kind of uh, were depleted and and only because uh, right now officially in a, an official capacity we have the GBO and of course we're excited about being at the GBO a little depleted that that's currently the only event on the calendar in an official capacity again we've had a few people reach out to us uh, about having coverage at at their event and 
Uh, but as of right now, GBO is the official one that's on the calendar for live coverage in uh, 2019. Also just asked of me is when the Maricopa Meadows Open is going to release. Uh, I reached out to Ulibari, Paul Ulibari, just today, and I said, I'd love to get some commentary from you. And whether that's uh, Paul and Pete or uh, was it Owen Bear maybe and, and Graham Russell, I, whatever. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, say I, I don't, almost don't care who does it. I would just love somebody from the event to be part of the commentary team uh, to find a way to make it happen. I, I would love to get them the raw files and let them just have at it. Uh, so that's where that stands as of right now. Uh, who's doing commentary for the Disco Pro Tour? That is uh, sounds like that's still in negotiations and that's still in the works. Uh We've, I think we've talked openly here that it's, it's not me. And uh, maybe or maybe not, we've already said that it's, it's not going to be Dixon Jowers. Uh, both of us have uh, had conversations with each other and with Steve, and it, it is not going to be us. I know that they're reaching out and uh, trying to secure some other commentators uh, I, I don't know if any of them are locked down, though, and, and that's, that's as much as I can say on that. I, I know they are actively pursuing commentators. Experienced I don't know. disc golfers. Yes, and I don't know if some or any of them have fully committed to being on board. That, that's all I know. I know they've asked, and they're going after people. Um, uh, to try and secure them, which is something that definitely should be happening. Um, but I don't, I don't know if anyone has been locked in on that. Uh, uh, e- Evie ahead. Cheese asks, does anyone know what the media plans are? I mean, you know, there's, there's no new news, uh, as we just said. I, I would say the only newest of news that Johnny and I are aware of is just that, that we, we know who's not commentating, and we know that they've asked other commentators I don't think there's any other new news outside of what's already been uh, established or talked about in the past. Uh, we Let's see here. Uh, Disc Golf Strong asks if I was going to be going to Vegas. I know I had talked a couple weeks ago about my plans to hopefully go to Vegas and, and do some filming. I worked with the PDGA, and it's actually not going to work. The... Uh, so the PDG has a new media plan, which I think in general is a really good media plan. And I know Steve Hill has worked his butt off getting this thing through all sorts of hoops, dealing with every single manufacturer and events and stuff like that. Well, one of the stipulations in the new media plan right now is that in order to cover a national tour event, you need to have a minimum of 720p resolution, which is basically every camera. You need to have two camera coverage. So that's going to kind of probably throw me out because my plan was to show up. Let, I mean, not just unexpected. I, I submitted something to the PDGA 30 days in advance, talked to Steve Hill about it. And then I wanted to come and film uh, just a solo card. I said, Hey, whatever card's not covered. So if you've got the top three or four or five, I'll cover the next one. I, I don't really care. But but unfortunately, um, that's not going to work out for Vegas for me. And I understand both sides of it. Like So on one hand, I look at it and say, ah, how are you passing up free coverage that I was going to come and cover on my own dime, single, single camera. Um, it was going to be obviously decent quality because I, I kind of know what I'm doing. And we are an experienced crew. But on the other hand, I understand the PDGA's perspective right now that say, hey, they've set some standards that say they want to have a floor, a a base level quality, and that is two camera coverage. And so currently for the Vegas event, uh, I'm not allowed to film. And I don't want to say it like that, like they're holding me back because I understand why they're doing it. And I'm not upset by any means. I'm not, you know, there are, he offered for me to come and maybe try other things. Like if we can work something else out. And I, right now the Vegas tickets are pretty expensive as it is for some strange reason. 
so there's less of an incentive for me to get there particularly so i'm hopefully looking at beaver state fling would be maybe might be the next time i'm out there so uh, what leads me to the next thought which would be if if they want two cameras and have that as a stipulation, which I, I completely understand, uh, would you entertain the idea of doing a some kind of a daily recap or a highlight video or well, something along those lines? Possibly. Because, I mean, I mean you I can't the, I no one would expect or assume you need two cameras for that. Correct. I know the PDGA particularly, I think they're going to try to do wrap-up videos again like they did at Worlds. I don't okay. know. I don't know any of the details about that. Uh, I know that was in the works. It might happen. It might not. But I believe it's more leaning towards it is going to happen. So, I've thought about doing something along the lines of what, like your old video blog, just interview a particular player. I've thought about maybe seeing if I can just follow. And this is where it gets a little hairy, because this is something we never even talked about. That we we skipped over one of the biggest news of the week, uh, with Dixon Jowers dropping the the kind of the the unknown bomb that the Vegas event is asking $5,000 for companies to come and do promotional videos there. And what we thought about that. And we, we completely skipped over that because we went right to Barella and I, I forgot to mention it afterwards. So I was thinking, well, maybe I could kind of do a follow a particular player and then do an interview interview with them at the end like just kind of hey i'm gonna pick one mm -hmm. player that's not on a, a featured card or not or maybe they are um, probably not though just based on how things are going and then do an interview with them at the end and kind of do a little wrap up and i don't know if that would even i don't know where that would fall into what area that would fall into if that falls into promotion if that falls into uh like a highlight video if that's a smash box thing I, I honestly haven't talked to Steve Hill about it at all, uh, that particular thought. And, you know, I had one or two other ones, but it is, yeah, th this particular event is very, it's very unique now because it's the first with the media plan. It is the first one to ever charge these crazy prices to have other uh, commercial. When, when you have pro tour events talking about charging hundred dollars, two hundred and fifty dollars, and then Vegas comes out and says we want five thousand. Yeah, have... it's it's definitely a uh, a very different approach and one that is cost prohibitive to any it, media crew. There, like there's it's, not. It's a it's a stupid fee. Period. The amount is stupid, not the fee. The amount, the five thousand dollars. Because well, and, and, at that point, just ahead. say, don't come, honestly. Just say, we don't want any other manufacturers there or any promotional videos filmed there. What I would like to see is them charge a lesser amount, like $1,000. And then that money can go back into the, go to the, uh, the, the, the people running the event, the organizational committee, go back into the, the, go into the player's purse or what, whatever you want to say. Do that. Because at five thousand, no one's going to come. You might as well say a million dollars. You lo you lower that number, and you might still get these people to come in and do this stuff. But then you can raise money for the event. I just think I, I don't know if it was fully thought through or if it was meant to purposefully keep people away. I honestly yeah, don't I, know. I, I think it was the latter. I think it was definitely uh, it, it was a number that. Uh, they wanted to put a, a substantial value on it, which I, I'm fine with how they arrived at it in that sense. But it's also a number that I think they knew would really chase anyone away uh, from wanting to be then part of it. $5,000, there's no company in disc golf that needs to be at that event badly enough where they'll say, okay, we'll come film that. Because at the next, you know, in two weeks, Half their players will be at A tiers or B tiers where they could go get the mm -hmm. filming done just the same. So, yeah, very interesting to see that unfold over at the uh, the Las Vegas Challenge for sure. And then uh, speaking of Innova, real quickly, another thing we glossed over is uh, in other news uh, reg with regard to Innova, Z uh, Zachariah Johnson 
picked up by Innova champion and is now, you know, we've seen him and talked about him a couple of times. I, I think if somebody rewound, you would hear me say that I didn't think it would, it would go all year, and it certainly hasn't. <laughs> In fact, the year really didn't even get started. And sure enough, he's picked up by someone. I, I wouldn't have guessed Innova, honestly, uh, because I just didn't see that coming and within their plan from what I've seen them do this year. So that somewhat surprised me. Uh, for whatever reasons, but uh, yeah, Zachariah Johnson picked up and now part of Team Innova. So, yeah, nobody's surprised there. He's a great player, and it, it was just to be a matter of time before someone picked him up. Correct. Uh, and and I do. I should I should uh, re recant. I should uh, say that there was an update on the on the Disc Golf Pro Tour media plan side in that it was said within a thread on Dixon Jowers uh, on the box uh, group on Facebook, uh, Danielle Charlier of the Disc Golf Pro Tour had mentioned that the somebody had asked about the, the media plan, part two of it, and she said that it's expected to be out early February. So for what that's worth, I feel like there's that's kind of a line now that or, or a new a new, I don't want to say finish line, a new uh, deadline or an actual deadline because we've just heard that it's going to be coming out later and that's been kind of repeatedly said and no one really knew exactly when. And now there was an actual date put on it that, well, date, time frame put on it that we would see it early February. So surprise for me. what that's worth. Yeah, I just kind of think what at this point we kind of know most of what's going to happen and 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 that, that I'm, I'm i'm curious the only reason i'm curious to see part two of the media plan is to see if they surprise me with something that i wasn't thinking of like oh we sure. we also have this this crazy idea that hasn't been done before or something like that but it, it, if it just comes out and says very similar to what they've said like yep we're going to do two camera we're going to have live we're going to do live fpo here are the list of uh five rotating uh, people doing commentary mm. or 10 or whomever, how many ever they decide, or if they don't know yet, I don't know. I mean, I, I think people are getting hung up on this part two of a media plan when it's going to come out and there's going to be, there's, I don't want to use the word, word disappointing. I think people are going to get their hopes up and it's going to disappoint them. It's going to be a fine plan. Just, I don't yeah. know if there's going to be anything surprising. Maybe they'll well, talk I, about, I, I don't think, I think the better word is impactful. Yes, I'm not sure there's a, going to be anything exactly. that's the that word. is that is truly going to be impactful to to our viewers. Yeah. That's going to uh, affect them one way or another. I mean, you're exactly right. A lot of people are hung up on the idea, and that's where I said even weeks ago, like I, I don't. It doesn't mean anything to me mm -hmm. what's going to be in it. I know where I stand as a creator uh, for what my plan is going to be regarding media, but uh, I, I don't know if there's going to be anything truly impactful or alarming whatsoever and i so. like i said i hope there is i hope they surprise me with something that sure. i wasn't that i wasn't thinking of like hey we're gonna have michael jordan be doing uh all our commentary or he's gonna be this third cameraman i don't know but it's that would be cool see that's what i'm saying um i, I hope they come out with something but if it's just going to be some real basics like i said maybe some pricing for charging companies to come or I think that was even already announced maybe part of the mm -hmm. media plan one I, I don't know I've seen so many things from different people that I, I'm, I'm starting to lose track of who has released what I, I don't think impactful is the better is the better word I don't think we're going to see much that people are going to that's going to impact what they are already know. viewing or consuming or already know I agree all right, I'm going to go rifle through some questions. Terry, what makes your putt wobble like Yeti's? I don't know. I certainly don't do it in intentionally. I would love for it not to, but it always has. That's a good question. Uh, I, I honestly do not know. Uh, Pro Tour will surprise you. JVD, come into Vegas. No, we've gone through all those. Uh, uh, Hodel Hand says he, that they won't miss Dixon. That's okay. Uh, hey, Terry and Johnny, good to catch some live coverage. It's been a while. Good to have you, Blake. Uh, I'll pause from that. Uh, Nick, uh, Blake Hill, had earlier mentioned, I think, on one of my, on my quick live stream today that uh, he had received his disc in the UK, his Smashbox TV Patreon disc. I just want to quickly say, 
I feel like I feel like every single person should have theirs. There might honestly be a straggler or two. I, I hope not. But if you have not received yours, please let me know. There was one that I tried to apparently send twice. <laughs> uh, it came back, and it says duplicate on it. <laughs> um, so it says duplicate label. So apparently I tried to print this person's twice. I think that's when actually my label maker ran out of labels, and so uh, somehow I missed that. Uh, but I do honestly feel like everyone that was supposed to receive a Patreon supporter disc should have one by now if you don't. And you should. I'll just double check it against the uh, list. And eh, I don't know if it'll get shipped out in the next 12 hours or not. If not, it may be a couple of weeks. But uh, please do let me know if yeah, you as haven't received it and you're supposed to. As everybody knows now, uh, they, the discs that everybody got, I believe, were all Emac Truths. Uh, I Correct. Think they, the burst. Fine plastic burst. Burst uh, Emac Truths. So I hope everyone. I, I was telling you when we were sitting there signing them, I don't know if I've ever seen a flatter disc in my life. Those things yeah. were just, I mean, they were they were thin and flat, and I really want to get a hold of, I, well, I want one in general for my collection, but I want to get a hold of one just to throw it, because from what everything, everybody says about the Emac Truths, that they're really good mid-ranges to have, so uh, I wouldn't mind getting a hold of one to throw at some point. Not in the winter, though. I'm too lazy. Okay. TJ says Smashbox wrap-up. I think TJ had also earlier said something about covering Masters Live. I think that was uh, something you had said. Unfortunately, I don't see that uh, probably happening too often. Someone did reach uh, out to me, and I don't know if I told you this, Terry, about covering a Guts tournament again this year. Um, mm -hmm. there, there was talks about it a couple of years ago, and mm -hmm. uh, so I, I need to reach out to him and get back to him about uh, what it might take. That would be kind of cool. Yeah, that would definitely be cool if we could do that. Uh, Bobby Swain, I think this is back on the commentator questions, uh, saying Sexton and Germ, I bet. I would bet not, um, mainly because I think they're going to be, I mean, they might be involved with the post-production side of things, maybe. I don't know if they would be, but they definitely can't be involved on a live production side of things, obviously, because uh, they'd probably be out on the course uh, during those times. Uh, Ronald Harkey, uh, who also earlier reminded us that he's uh, 10 years cigarette free as of today. So congratulations on that, Ronald. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine not having a positive response and uh, and a, a cheer for that for anyone that wants to quit. Um, so congratulations on that. He says, did anyone catch Jomez's AMA video and? Uh, that's out on the, what, the Reddits? Is that be, where that's that, uh, the The Reddits cool are where the thing? AMAs are. They said that they were going to answer every question that came to them, which wow. yeah, boggles that's, my mind. I have not had a chance. That's a bold move. I would not do that. <laughs> no, me, me, me neither. I should have thrown a lot some, of questions. I, oh, I should have thrown some bombs in there. <laughs> you should have. Uh, what's the uh, closest that Jerry and Michael have come to kissing? <laughs> that's what I want to know. Like just bumped into each, jump bumped into each other in an RV maybe like whoa hey there buddy <laughs> I mean you spend a lot of time with those guys uh, too much. get just fill up their questions with all these random crazy <laughs> things uh, I have not had a chance to watch the Reddit uh, AMA yet uh, as he, it was because of travel and all that other fun stuff but I'm <laughs> I'm hoping I'm hoping to get in there uh Joel asks are you guys coming out to La Mirada for the Disc Golf World Tour uh. <laughs> I think you're about uh, three? three years late on that, but no. Uh, we'll try. Has We're Climo still been on it. asked for commentary? Any idea if Climo could get more involved on the media side? Uh, I'm I'm guessing he's been asked whether or not he's going to be involved or not. I have no idea. I would be willing to bet from a commentary, live commentary perspective. I bet you he's been asked, but I don't know of any responses. Uh, I dig Dixon. I like Steve Hill and McCall, but do they have a conflict of interest? Um, Steve Hill uh, would likely not uh, have the opportunity or be uh, commentating on uh, the Pro Tour events, although he could, but I, I doubt that would uh, happen. And then Robert McCall, um, you know, Robert McCall obviously has worked with us in certain situations. I know he's going to work with us on the GBO side of things. Um, you know, someone like a Robert McCall or Eric McKay, very interesting um, situations. And, and, and this could be said of what we found on the advertising side. If you have a particular 
person that is directly tied to a particular manufacturer, could another presenting sponsor or manufacturer be frustrated or upset or or annoyed or whatever the word would be that there's a competitor doing commentary. And so we'll just throw out some names here. An event brought to you by the, uh, the Innova's uh, Idlewild Open, obviously an Innova-centric event, would, we'll say the Pro Tour, have uh, get any kickback or challenge if they had someone like a Robert McCall and an Eric McCabe calling all of the shots being DD players. Now, I personally don't have a problem with that because I know those are both great stand-up humans and individuals, and they're not going to have some silly bias uh, that is that is off-putting or overwhelming, in my opinion. I think they are far too professional to want to, t- you know, come across that way. However, um, that maybe can- couldn't be said of every single player. Maybe there is a player that plays for one team that, whether they know it or not, is incredibly biased and and you know uh, taints the broadcast in that way. I and could in that case could the Idlewild and Innova be upset about that? Yeah, maybe. I mean. It's kind of similar to what we saw on the advertising side. You know, you go to the Ledgestone Insurance Open presented by Discraft with hundreds of thousands of dollars thrown in by Discraft. And if, uh, you know, a post-production company like a Jomez comes in and has all in of a sponsorship on it, that, that can create a problem, a legitimate problem. So uh, will commentary do the same? Maybe, maybe not. Well, I've, I've asked you this question, Terry, um, and we'll throw it out there. What is a commentator worth? What is a value you put on that? What what would you pay somebody, or what should they be paid if you have? We'll just say you. So they ask you versus they ask Robert McCall versus they ask Ken Climo. Are those varying amounts? Or I mean, I would throw Nate Sexton out there, but he's probably playing in most of these events, so doing mm-hmm. live is tough. You're talking about. We'll say eight hours a day to cover FPO and MPO, assumingly, if you're going to be doing live coverage. What is the value you charge for that? I mean, I can't think of doing it for less than 500 bucks. Yeah, I mean, you're talking eight hours a day. Are you prepping for it? Do you have to do anything other than just, I'll say, just sitting down? But what kind of prep work are you doing for it? Uh, do you have the skill sets where you could be a lead as opposed to maybe, uh, you know, just calling the shots or, 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 you know, what is your specific role? Everyone has varying levels of, uh, what's the word, uh, experience, but not just experience, but varying levels of comfort and, uh, and, and the position in the role that they're just trying to fill. I think those are all very important uh, tasks and things to consider. And then are you traveling to the event? I mean, whether you're a cameraman or whether you are a commentator or whether you're out there spotting, like all three of those people potentially require food, lodging, airfare, a rental car. Like there's all those expenses that get, you know, can be added in as well if you're on site. So yeah, that's a really good question. And then what's your actual value of you while you're there? And does a Ken Climo get paid more than, uh, I'll just say myself, just to use as an example, because I've done so much commentary. To, and, and if so, why? Is it because he's better or because he has more rings? Or or what if he's not as good, but comes with comes with the rings? I mean, that, those are, I'm just spitting out hypotheticals, but those are all really good questions. Um, you know, can, can, can uh, appropriately throw to commercials and, and do other things offset um, that need to be done, you know, behind the scenes? That's a good question. Uh, and what, you, what do you get paid daily? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, and for me, it was always weird because 
I feel like I wore six or eight or 10 or 15 other hats. There was never a compensation for you to sit down and just do commentary. And, and eight hours of commentary, believe it or not, as much as even I love to talk, that's still mentally exhausting. Like you need to be on point and hopefully not too much of like an idiot for an entire day. And that's, that's tough. Well, everyone's scrutinizing or listening to every word that you say. I don't know. Uh, good question. I, I think I kind of posed that question a few months ago. Like, what is the value of a commentator? And I wasn't doing it selfishly. I'm genuinely curious. And then, Johnny, take that a step further. Let's mm -hmm. just say you had Sexton doing commentary because he's injured. Um, you know, what are the going rates for eight hours of live commentary during the day versus uh, one hour of sitting at, sitting down and doing post-production commentary? I mean, those are very, very different. Those are similar, but yet very different. So I think all those things have to be uh, considered. All right, excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, Makers Telemark says drone previews are so 2016. Would you rather watch a preview of someone walking each hole? No, I I, uh, I I said before I like what we did. I'm done with drone previews. I think they're nice, but I think they should be uh, a supplement to a player standing there and telling you what how it should be thrown, and then maybe throwing the shot, and then you can go to a drone preview. I think it needs to be a nice mix. But just having the drone preview there, I think it's it's boring, honestly. So I, I hope I hope we see I'm, I hope we see more of the uh, the opposite. That's my thought. I, I'm a little I'm somewhere in between. I I I do like them, and I think they can be great. But I don't think they're the end all be all. Um, yeah, I think I think there's some other stuff that can be done, and I think you're gonna uh, see some of that. Uh, Disc Golf Nerd says Beaver State Fling is way better than Vegas, so that you should be out there. And then there's a little more talk about drone previews, highlight network, things you could be doing there, Disc Golf uh, Sports Center, and those types of things. Uh, again, re regarding uh, Vegas conversations. Uh, Terry does love doing highlight journalism, uh, was originally resistant to shot by shot. That is very true, as you uh, probably heard in the Simon video as well. Um, would you rather pay to watch disc golf, period? Would you rather order VHS, DVD, stream back like in the day? Yeah, those were definitely some of the days. Um, disc Golf Planet used to always just do the highlight shots with music in the background and a journalistic narrative. Um, I'm not sure what you're referencing. I mean, Disc Golf Planet's main agenda was to be live and then sometimes I think would put out some uh, other pieces after afterward was the ama kind of boring guys with cameras in front of camera uh, i doubt it was i mean if you love and, Jonas, and I, I haven't seen it yeah i was gonna say it, i haven't seen it or watched it or listened to it or read any of it but i i'm guessing there's a lot of really good insightful stuff in there i would i would assume so um more live you... coverage from liquor store closets or libraries that that would definitely be one way we could go about it. You might get that this year. If you got it last year, why wouldn't you expect to see it next year? Oh, Robert McCall's on the board and says, I know all of the media plans. Share them, Robert. He's only joking. Robert does not know the media plans. What a jerk. Uh, Disc Golf Pro Tour on its own will never do live FPO. I No, they're doing... Disagree. They're doing. Yeah, live, they're, they are. They have plans to do live FPO and. Yeah, they are uh, doing live FPO this year. That is MPO. one of their big, uh, uh, you know, upgrades, so to speak, is that they're going to have live FPO. Um, <laughs> more talk about the previews. You don't watch round two if you have no idea, man. I appreciate it. All right, Wait, Joe Mez follow flight. Sorry, I'm just getting caught up on our board. Co-ed commentary is the wave of the future. Oh, wait, that was 15 years ago. You want to pull a bigger audience, that's how. Um, what do you think of that, Johnny? Do you feel like co-ed commentary is is crucial to the success of of uh, disc golf, no. you know, live or post right now? No, I don't think it's crucial. It's nice. It's It's a great feature. It's we've seen some women who are very good at it. We've seen some women who are not as good at it. And 
it's just that's the way it works. Just like we've seen men step in to do post commentary who people don't like. And there are some men who excel at it. I don't think it's crucial. I personally like to see it. Mm -hmm. it. It all depends on the on the on the group you get. You and Hannah together were great, but mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, maybe you put uh, Robert McCall and Hannah together, and they don't gel as well. I, I I mean that's just an example. You could put or, or who any name any male and female together, yeah. and you don't necessarily know if they're going to work out well together. But individually, Robert's great. Anna's great, you're great, but mix the three together and we don't know. Traditionally with sports, we see we have seen more men in the commentating position and a woman as a sideline reporter. Now, I know with the NFL, they are pushing on, I believe it's the I believe it's Amazon the Thursday night football. Uh, Amazon has been doing some as well, but it might even be NFL network that they are putting women in the commentating booth. And selling it as, hey, guess what? We're gonna have two women do commentating on this men's huh. game, and that was that. That's a clearly a uh, uh, a media push, because honestly, it shouldn't matter if you're getting the same information, but it does because it hasn't been done before. So, uh, yeah, and I guess they're you know whether they feel like that's. Uh, providing new opportunities or or going after a certain demographic or if that's uh, yeah I, I, yeah that is that is a really interesting approach to make a concerted effort to do just that um, huh would be interesting uh, to see think... now w one question that I think you and I uh, it's fair to say that you and I both have and and we don't know uh, who has been locked in for doing any commentary on the pro tour. Uh, it would will it change up the dynamic if we have, for instance, two women commentating on the men's round in the afternoon, but maybe two men commentating on the women's round? Or are we doing all of disc golf a, a disservice by not at least having one woman during the women's round? Is that is that a reverse sexism I, or not uh, know, in, when looking at it that way? I know this sounds silly after what I just said, but. I would mm -hmm. not want to see two men in general commentate on the women, just as I don't okay. think I'd want to see two women commentate on the men. I okay. think not they at least not that I've seen. Not not there's I don't believe there's any two women that I have seen together that I think I prefer over a man woman combination. Um and it is it is a, it is a different game what the men are playing and what the women are playing as far as the shot selection they're making. You know, ultimately we all play the same game. We grab a disc and we throw it as close to the basket as we can, and we do that until it goes in. But it it is this: the women are sometimes playing from different tees, and even when they're not, sometimes the men are taking different shots. The, yeah, and, and, and just the, completely different lines with completely now. Yeah, if we had a a a pro female commentator who wasn't a player, who just strictly stuck with commentating, I think that would be different. But what we have right now are players who go out, play the course, they learn the course to their game, and then they to come and commentate on another player's who is almost completely different to their game is more difficult. Now, if you had a, a, a person a male or female, like I, I think Dixon was pretty good at this and you, and I think Hannah could be very good and probably a couple others go out there and say, okay, I've, I've followed some of the men. I followed the women. These are the shots that look like they're going to take. This is the angle. This is the selection. I think that could happen. I think we could do that, but we're not there. We don't have a, a, a particular dedicated woman or a dedicated man for that point anymore. Um, sorry, Terry. Um, that is coming to two commentary. It's. I'm not sure. I would love to see it. I think it would be awesome to have that, that one person or two people, that really, really, know everything about the players, the course, the shot selection, the discs. Be able to take the time to dedicate to to know, what these players are going to do ahead of time. And we're not. Yeah. Smashbox wasn't there. It, that requires no. a lot of that requires a lot of effort. 
I don't think the Pro Tour is going to be there. We're just not there as a, we're just not there yet as a sport. Yeah, and I was just going to say that, exactly that. In order to have all of those components, all of those ingredients that you just said, that requires essentially a full-time effort to doing just that and nothing but that. And, and, and maybe to, again, reference what I was saying earlier, commentary was something that I enjoyed doing that I was part of, but it wasn't my sole focus at any given event. Mm -hmm. And so to not uh, you know, dedicate, and, and maybe I'm not even, would even put myself in that category as someone who could, because I am busy thinking about so many other things, uh, because I want to be outside of just my commentary role. So, um, it, it will be interesting to see if anyone emerges and fits that role or fills that gap, uh, in terms of being 100% focused on nothing but commentary and all of the things that it takes to be, uh, you truly a standout, the best possible commentator. Um, you know, I even think of a Robert McCall who I enjoy working with and he's one of my favorites to be in the booth with. I, I think about all the other hats he's wearing. You know, as the GBO is going on, he's commentating with me. However, you know, half hour before the round, he was talking to 10 different players on the DD team and being a team manager. And then after the round, he's got to go run a Q&A session or he's got to go be an MC for something else. Like he's wearing all these different hats aside from just sitting down and calling the shots during that round. And that's just where we are in disc golf. It's, it's where a lot of us are doing a lot of different things. I mean, I could be out working a camera one minute and then <laughs> inside the booth, you know, a half hour later, it's just, that's, that's we, where we're at. We go old school and you run the camera and the commentary commentary at once. I, yeah, that's a good call. I should just do more of that. I'm going to go back to 2014. Ah, oh, much simpler time when I wore all the equipment and did the camera and did the commentary all at once. Sweet. Ah, let, let's go back to those days. That's what we need. Let's do it. <laughs> anyway. That was a long, <laughs> that was a long side jag about media and commentating and all that other fun stuff. Yes. So. Uh, Evie Cheese said, any chance of Jomez pairing with Smashbox for pre, live, and post-production? Uh, it doesn't look that way. Uh, you know, Jomez is, uh, I feel like is, they, they have a really set goal and vision in, in being the best possible post-production setup ever. And uh, they work really hard at that and their branding. And I think that's a, a very big sticking point for them is where they are at with their branding and the vision that they have. And, uh, you know, I know we've kind of joked with them in the past about like, hey, you guys, you know, or others have said you guys should get into live. And it, it does not appear to be of any interest to Jonathan, at least every time it's been mentioned in the last few years, at least. I don't know if that will ever change or if his opinion or his mentality will change on that ever. But uh, that doesn't seem to be any part of his uh, his MO whatsoever. David John said, uh, Terry hustling around the course, talking in the background of the players was the best disc golf media coverage. <laughs> yeah, those were, those were definitely some of the days. Uh, and Ronald Harkey kind of echoes what I was just saying, said that Jomez said in their AMA that live is not in their future. Well, to be fair, Paul Macbeth also once famously said he can't see himself throwing anything but in of us. So I'm, uh, I'm just saying things can he change. Never, he ne I don't think he ever actually said those words. but Really? Because I think there's Correct. a commercial that says that. No, the, if you listen to the commercial, he, I think he says along the lines that he, wouldn't, he can't imagine being here or something along those lines. I don't believe he ever said he can't imagine throwing anything but in of a... I think you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> Good. That's a whole conversation. All of our disagreement should go. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, you know, it wouldn't be a show in my house if I didn't randomly pick a couple of discs off uh, off here to see what we have. Since I know a lot of people love to ask. Um, this is just a random stack of stuff. There's no product placement here whatsoever. Uh, first one on top. This is some of the Hall of Fame 
right? Johnny, I think you need this, actually. I know you I, do. I do. I need that Taylor Hall of Fame disc. Yes. This is I, the 2018 Hall of Fame uh, with George Sappenfield, Jay Redding, and Andy Lemon Young. So this year's Hall of Fame uh, inductees all signed by them on a Black Star Rock X3. So that was one disc that I have yet to file away. Here's a 2015 Ledgestone TI Zone. Uh, lots of these were purchased at one point. So I've got one of those sitting there. Ooh. Hey, hey Terry. We, you, let's give this away tonight. What is that? This is a Disc Golf Guy stamped Icon Aftermath from our friends at Legacy. Okay. Uh, can I have you watch something real quick first? Sure. Oh, is it? Always thrown Innova and competed with Innova. I don't think I'd be playing the sport if it wasn't for him. Creating the disc itself and then just taking it to the next level over and over and over again. How great the discs are themselves. It's really gained my trust and I don't think I would be here without Innova. I don't think I would be here. I he and and is that the only commercial they have? No, but I believe that's the one everyone references. <laughs> I think there's a commercial where he says, I can't see throwing anything but Innova. Maybe. I'll, I'll go through the archives because I should have basically every commercial made by Innova. Can we charge them because we just played that commercial? I don't think so. I think we actually lose money because it has Paul Macbeth in it now. So I want to apologize to Innova and Paul Macbeth for playing that. Uh, uh, wait for the cease and desist. All right. Here's, oh. Here is... This is a tasty. So this is a 10-year buzz. You can just send that uh, my in way. In a very unique, like, muddyish brown color. I think I was offered $150 for this a couple weeks ago. Um, I didn't put it back in the vault yet, so it still sits here. Lots of randomness. Anyway. Hey, yeah, you can, yeah, so it, you can uh, just send that my way, Terry. That buzz. Yeah, no, not so much. I'm I'm actually just finishing the import of the the players so uh, of all of our oh. Patreon supporters. Oh, I do want to give another quick shout out actually because a couple of these other ones are sitting here too. I mentioned a few times and I'm going to say it again. Uh, Disc Baron has been a supporter of us uh, through super chats and other ways, and he sent me some stuff. Uh, so this is Disc Baron. I want to say thank you. I believe this is a rock of sorts. So thank you. We're also at some point going to give away this dilly dally stamped uh, disc baron disc. Uh, it's a latitude 64 something that I can't read. Saint. So let's give that away. We'll give that away tonight. There we go. Done. We're going to give the we'll saint give that away? away. The saint away. Um, so thank you. Uh, and and for some of you that uh, to follow up uh, from a few weeks ago, in talking with Hannah and Dustin, they had because uh, both Smashbox and then the Disc Golf Guy personally had sponsored the Zambia Open. Uh, I received one of these, so beautiful Zambia Open disc. Uh, thanks to uh, everyone over there. And this one arrived. This one's a kind of a special gem, from what I've been told. Uh, only a hundred of these produced, oh, and you the when you made Palmer, a large, is, yeah, this is a glow, uh, that, buzz by. What number do you have? Forty-six out of a hundred. Now, let me be clear. From what I understand, that's not just when you made a big order. That is, they sent that to longtime. Discraft supporters and team members oh. because I saw uh, I want to say did Chris Heron have like number two or something okay and and I, I believe they said like or maybe it was Larry LeBond I saw somebody post they had number two and they even mentioned who had number one but I, I honestly don't recall they sent them out to a lot of uh, supporters and team members longtime team members okay well uh Maybe it's from my time on the team from 2005 to 2006. You think you're stuck uh, in their it, database? They can't delete you? They just can't yeah, for whatever it's, reason? It's good to see Macbeth following in my footsteps. File, that, that's, that file is locked for whatever reason. 
Another 10-year buzz. Do you like those? I I mean the 10-year ones are nice, but I've got I've got a couple of them as well. I'm just I want I, I prefer some of the original bar stamps. I'm sure you have stock stock. Oh, away. I got a bunch of those. I know. I'll steal those, those are... from you. All right. Let's throw uh, let's give ooh, this, a little bit of let's give this something away. All right, you do that. I'll keep here's a tear bear stamped jawbreaker zone that's actually one of my favorites uh that i don't want to have anywhere here's some mvp love here's a tear bear stamped mvp uh matrix oh and then actually what i collect some people ask this uh this one came in recently this is an ontario rock from the late 90s and uh you don't see these in this shape all too often and it's 153 grams which is even cooler because you don't see a lot of 150 uh, class versions of those so uh good old ontario rock all right we've got a bunch of different companies represented here tonight we do are you done showing discs yeah sure all right I just figured everyone's gonna ask well, yeah, people like to see plastic. I told you that's why we're going to start a new podcast, another new podcast where we go into uh, go into your storage and just go through your crap. All right, so Patreon.com. If you would like to be eligible for the <laughs> for the weekly Patreon giveaway, you can go to Patreon.com/slash/SmashboxTV, and for as little as a dollar a month, you can be eligible to win one of our wonderful prizes. A lot of those discs that Terry showed, you will not be eligible to win. <laughs> uh, just the one we decide we're going to give away. But you know what, Terry? Actually, we're going to put, we're going to take your disc and we're going to hold it for a, a week because tonight we're doing the disc member box. Oh, geez. Yes. All right. So I reached out. Uh, Evan from Disc Member has reached out to me and he said, Hey, guys, um, are you guys still good for 2019? And I said, Oh, heck yeah. Let's make this happen. So you are going to be picking up, I believe it will be the February box for Disc Member. And Disc Member is a subscription service. You can pay $25 a month, and they will send you a box full of disc golf goodies. It usually, it always includes a disc, uh, usually includes something like a t-shirt, uh, other disc golf paraphernalia, such as sometimes it's a scorecard, a hat, bottle opener, uh, there was one other, uh, sometimes U-Disc subscriptions, things like that. So if you are interested, go to discmember.com. Let them know that we sent you particularly. If you heard this on another podcast, still let them know we sent you. I mean, that's what we do. Uh, if you don't want to be a Patreon supporter, to us in general, go out to iTunes and give us a five-star review. That always helps as well. Uh, I don't really care what you put down for comments in there because nobody reads them anyway. The five-star review is what helps. So tonight we have 211 patrons. You can, again, patreon.com slash smashbox TV. We are going to give away the disc member box. That is a $50 value for $25, but you will pay nothing tonight. Zero dollars. Zero dollars out of your Shipping pocket. from me to you is covered by us, even, even though actually, USPS rates just went up. Actually, Terry, we worked it out, so they will ship it directly from them. Oh, even better. So, uh, awesome. so it's still free. So it's still, it's free, still free. Free, free. It's still free. It's still free for you. 211. Terry, what number should we do tonight? Wow, I don't have anything good. Let's go two. We've had two. Barella on the show just twice. He's won two events this year. Two sounds good. Two sounds great. All right, the first number is 23. The second number is 69, dudes. Um, so we yeah, are... Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, 69. Hans Anderson. Hans Anderson. Uh, in Germany. In Germany. Um, Hans, we'll get I'm that. Just... Is it? Is he in Germany? I, I, just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't have his address in here. So, Hans, we're going to talk to <laughs> talk to them about that because if, if you are in Germany, I'm not sure about the disc member box. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have not worked that out with Evan. So, we might give out the disc member box next week. Um, and we might have to send Hans something else. So if so, then you'll get that disc, that disc Terry showed. If not, we'll uh, I will find out uh, about the uh, the disc member box. So congratulations, Hans, on something that you won tonight. One way or another, you won something. You're a winner. Uh, real quick, a uh, little housekeeping. Next week, I'm hoping I will likely not be there for the full show. It will be uh, 
Thailand is 13 hours ahead. So it, we're doing that math. That would put it at 10 a.m. on Wednesday morning. I believe I am scheduled to actually maybe play in the tournament in, I'll find a new <laughs> in Thailand. So, yeah, uh, we'll have to see. I, I may stop in or say hi for a few minutes or something. However, there's a good chance uh, I will be at a limited amount if I'm able to be there next Tuesday night or Wednesday morning in my case. Taking applications on a good co-host? Please. It's super easy, except for you got to put up with Johnny's shit. All the time. Other than that, it's super easy. Like organizing the show, doing the giveaway, all that fun yep. stuff. Yep, <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. But if so, you take Terry's job, it means you need to line up a guest. That's, that's what Terry <laughs> does for me. <laughs> uh, I do that, yes. Yuli or McCall, both of them would be good for you. Yeah, exactly. So, all right, guys, I think we can call it. I don't have a heck of a lot more. I've got a lot of stuff to pack. I've got laundry to do and uh, cameras to and things to label and stuff to get ready. Uh, super excited to head over. Uh, huge shout out to Dynamic Disc for supporting the event. Huge shout out to Luke and Nigel and uh, everyone over in Thailand that I'll see. And and I'm going to double down and say huge shout out again to Dynamic Disc for supporting uh, this last weekend's event in Maricopa the way you guys did. Them and, and Lucky Disc Golf were uh, so much of the reason for me being there and uh, for the event being as big as it is. So thank you to Maricopa and, as I said, Chris and Boyd and Pat and Dan and, and Hav and all those uh, awesome people uh, out in Maricopa. So thank you to all of you guys. Uh, again, I really appreciate it. And and I'm going to throw in there again our huge super chatter tonight uh, in uh, Chris and the La Nina Open. Please, everyone, uh, you can win baskets. They're raffling off 10 baskets full size regular baskets uh you can win those check out it uh with dynamic discs and uh support that event in any way you can and if you know a woman even thinking about going uh to play in a women's only event uh that is definitely one that they need to check out up there in washington right around like that beaver state uh portland open time frame that's something they should be checking out for sure okay el guapo baskets exactly that's what we love to see. No video coverage for the memorial, George. Come on, where you been? Disc yes, golf. You'll see plenty. Pro Tour will have all of that. It will have it all. All right, Bobby, TJ, George, Blake, Hodel, Darren, all you guys, all our regular smashies. Ronald Harkey again. <clears throat> Congrats on the 10 years free of uh, smoking. And uh, Jordan and everyone else, Robert McCall. Thank you guys all. Ryan Pilcher, the whole crew. Thank you. For Johnny V, Terry Miller, the disc golf guy, hopefully we'll see you next week from Thailand when you step inside the Smashbox.